This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Live. Oh, that sounded exciting, didn't it? Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 42nd meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses today will be briefing us via video conference. The meeting is being broadcast live and the recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. And just to remind members to mute their tablet devices when they're not speaking. Um, the committee is received three, three briefings this morning, um, so we are quite tight for time, so we're going to have to try and strictly adhere to the indicative timings for each of these um, to try and get through everything. Um, so if, if members don't mind, we will try and adhere to um, one question at a time for members and um, bring people back in if we do have time. So, Peter, I don't think we have any apologies unless there's... Chair John Stewart has offered apologies, so we'll note that. OK, thank you. OK, thanks for that, Peter. Um, so moving on then to item number two, which is Chair's business. Um, and if members can uh, refer to page five of your pack, there's a response from S FSB with their views on the trade bill. Um, the committee had sought views from our stakeholders in relation to the trade bill. The trade bill is now moving to the report stage in the House of Lords on the 7th of December. Um, and members will remember that we, we have discussed um, the trade bill previously in relation to having not yet had an LCM in respect of that. So um, it's to note unless members have any other comments that they want to make. Um, Peter, if you want to flag to me if people are. Mr Stalford, um, I yeah, have, yeah, happy, happy to note that, but just under Chair's business, because I, I think it would have fallen uh, to you as the Chair of the Committee, at last week's committee meeting, I had asked that we write to the Department for their assessment of what the level of unemployment is likely to be once furlough comes to an end. Have we? We, we have a response. Oh, good. Um, it's... It's difficult to pin down figures, um, but we, we have that in the pack. So oh, sorry, I must have missed no, it. No, no, you're fine. It's, I think we do anyway. Mm. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm consulting my people because the pack tends Does they to give us a number? Um, actually, no, we, we don't have a number. I'm trying to think, am I confusing it with something else? We will get there. Okay. If, let me let me work on that in the time being. That's no, grand. Sure. We do have a response, Peter, in relation to the question that we had put about the, the cost of um, trading have, in, yeah, in terms of Brexit. Cost. Is that maybe? That's what we yeah. were thinking about. So we haven't had the other one back yet. Okay. We haven't had the other one back yet. Thank you. But Thanks. it's in. It's in, Chair. The question's in. No cost. Um, okay, then, so there is also a draft letter which I believe members have in front of them, uh, which Neil. Peter circulated earlier. Yeah. So, where's the letter? I emailed it to you this morning, maybe about mm. 15 20 minutes ago. Yeah, right. It's the one from mm. the, the four chairs. <laughs> uh, about student uh, mental health and social and financial well-being issues. So, the, the um, Chair, if you want to give a bit of background on where that came from. Yeah, sure. Okay, so if members recall, um, I think it was the week before last, actually, that we had agreed that we would reach out to the other committee chairs um, who have a, a remit in respect of the, the student issues that have been raised with the committee in relation to uh, mental health, hardship, well-being, th those type of issues. So the um, chairs of health communities and the executive office met yesterday um, morning and we had a, a, some discussion around the issues uh, and we agreed that we would point to the First Minister's highlighting the issues and, and seeking a collaborative executive approach to dealing with the, the student issues. So um, if members have that draft there in front of them to have a look at and um, if they would be content then that we would forward that letter to the other committees to seek their approval um, for sending it to, to the, the First Minister's. Chair, uh, Mr Middleton would like to make comment. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chair. Well, it's just to say that I think it's a, a very good letter uh, it's an important one. Um, I know when I questioned the Health Minister uh, this week around <coughs> in relation to the health advice for, for the second semester, uh, and, and 
well, it, it wasn't overly clear. And in fairness, I know there's feelings around uh, the Department for Economy and, and what role it's playing. And, and I think that we do need someone really to grasp this issue and provide clarity for the students. So I think this is a very good letter, Chair. So thank you. Thanks for that, Gary. Um, does anybody else want to, to make a comment in respect to that? No, I would agree with this. Agreed. Agreed. Chair, I would agree as well. Okay, okay Chair, that well, members are that. content. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll forward that on to the other committees with the hope that we will get it cleared this week and away on Friday. Thank you for that, Chair. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, so moving on then to item number three, which is our draft minutes. So there is a copy of the draft minutes from last meetings with or last week's meeting on the 25th of November at page eight of your packs. Are members content that these are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So moving on to item number four is our briefing from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, the Business and Human Rights Forum. Um, so there is only five, 45 minutes for this briefing. So um, if members can just be brief in terms of their own remarks and questions following the, the briefing um, from um, the Human Rights Forum or the Business and Human Rights Forum. There is a clerk's memo at page 14 of the packs, the NI Business Human Rights Forum briefing papers at page 16 and the NI Action Plan on Business and Human Rights at page 19. Um, the forum meetings are held three times a year and to date meetings have focused on a range of issues relating to business and human rights, including modern slavery, the impact of Brexit on business and human rights, poverty and mental health in the workplace and the impact of COVID-19 on business and human rights. So if I could welcome to this morning's meeting um, Les Allenby, who is Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and Glenn Bradley, who is Chair of the Business and Human Rights Forum. Um, so if they can please be brought into the spotlight and if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement and then we will bring members in. Thank you. Thanks, Kiba. Can I check? Can you see me and hear me? Yeah, we, we can, we can hear, hear you, you, but okay, we can't see you. See you. See your okay, well, <laughs> that's probably the lesser of two evils. So, <laughs> see the window. If I just press on, is that okay? <laughs> Les, Le, your camera is pointing in the other direction. If you can reorient it, um, there, there may um, be a button for that, but if not, we'll we just go ahead. Um, sorry, it's way beyond my technical competence, I'm afraid. So. Uh, I'll just talk if that's all right. Um, and you can, um, <laughs> I'll, leave it to, I'll leave what I look like to your imagination. Um, but thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I know time is um, pressing. Um, it really appreciate the invite this morning. And I'm gonna start by making a few brief opening remarks on the forum and its work, and then hand over to our chair, Glenn Bradley, who will outline why adhering to human rights is good for business and then happy to take any questions. Um, the lineage to the forum comes from the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which was unanimously endorsed by United Nations in June 2011. And in a nutshell, they require governments to respect, protect and fulfill human rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, businesses are expected to comply with all applicable laws and to respect human rights. And the third pillar is the need for rights and obligations to have an effective remedy when breached. The Commission sees that as a flaw uh, and not a ceiling. And governments were asked by the UN to produce national action plans to implement the guidance. The UK government, to its credit, was first out of the traps in 2013 to introduce the first national action plan anywhere. It was refreshed in 2016 not a great document, I have to say. Ireland produced its own in 2017, and the Business and Human Rights Forum had an involvement in, in discussions with the DFAT on that. But the background to why the Commission set up a human rights forum was that in 2013, we published a document on public procurement and human rights. And what that document found was that there were there was an extensive legal and policy framework for public procurement, but no, almost no reference of human rights standards and the need to comply with them in procurement. We procure around £2.7 billion worth of goods and services from government departments and public uh, and arm's length bodies. So we are a 
you are as a government and and, uh, and uh, public bodies a, a very extensive purchaser of services and therefore this is important so we decided to set up the forum um you've outlined the <clears throat> the work uh, it's a broad ranging forum we deliberately set the bar low to be involved we have private companies uh, from manufacturing legal recruitment agencies building firms government departments public bodies uh academic organizations um trade unions and developmental ngos um all participate along with umbrella organizations like the federation of small businesses um but it's not simply a talking shop we've done some practical work um one of those was the a partnership with the Department of Finance to produce the guidance note on procurement and how to ensure that human rights best practice is embedded in procurement. Uh, we've done work with the two universities. We've held a number of MOOCs for business school students. Uh, we organized a lecture by the owner of People Tree on how to run an ethically based um, fashion and retail company. We are in the second year of work with the CUB in school, developing a module on human rights, um, which is part of what we see as a generation. Um, I can give you an example of um, the work we've most recently done. We held a meeting in October with the uh, main speaker is the uh, Sarah Thornton, uh, the chair of of the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner. Uh, the Minister for Justice was in attendance and spoke and so did the um, Chief Inspector of uh, Criminal Justice. And um, that looked at the question of how we embed, uh, and a quite difficult question, how we deal with modern slavery, particularly looking at Brexit, where we have both an open border and a desire to make sure that we um, prevent human trafficking and modern slavery. So it's practical issues that we're dealing with. The business plan that you have in your pack um, is our attempt at a first draft of a national action plan for Northern Ireland on business and human rights. Um, we're very keen to uh, look to get others to endorse that. Now the assembly's back. Um, we would be very keen, I think, to have a joint meeting with the committee at some point in the future um, and at that point, I think I'll stop there and hand you over to Glenn to kind of give you the why, in practice, human rights is, is important. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Les. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair, and everyone in the committee for having us. I'll just continue. Les has brought us up to 2020, but I want to take us slightly forward to 2030, and then we'll come back to where we are now. Our planet faces massive economic, social, and environmental challenges. To combat these sustainable development goals, uh, define global priorities and aspirations for 2030. They represent an unprecedented opportunity to eliminate extreme poverty and put the world on a sustainable path. Governments worldwide have already agreed to these goals, and now it's time for business to play its part. And the reason it's, it's time for business is that within the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Article 67, which is agreed by all 193 UN member states, is unambiguous when it states, private business activity, investment and innovation are major drivers of productivity, inclusive economic growth and job creation. We acknowledge the diversity of the private sector, ranging from micro-enterprises to cooperatives to multinationals. We call on all businesses to apply their creativity and innovation to solving sustainable development challenges. Now, all of us should learn from this COVID crisis that there must be a coordinated effort to create decent work for all as the foundation of a green, inclusive, and resilient recovery. A recovery where the primacy of human rights and the environment are the priority and where business models that degrade human beings are our environment are simply no longer permitted. 
Within the Northern Ireland Business and Human Rights Forum, we understand the business case for the Sustainable Development Goals. We are helping our members define priorities and map their value chains to define impact areas. We are, have modelled a scope of goals and, and key performance indicators that our members can expedite in action to meet the SDG business commitments with carbon neutrality by 2030. However, it's not just about the environment, and I must reiterate that. It is about human rights due diligence, anti-corruption due diligence, and evolving labour standards. It's simply about doing business responsibly to solve human or labour rights issues and abuse via recognised initiatives. And I emphasise recognised initiatives because some aren't that assure workers are free from exploitation and discrimination and work in conditions of freedom, security and equity. It's about advancing the communities in which our influence as corporates are felt. So, in simplified terms, human rights, including workers' rights, are defined in a body of international conventions which states adopt and implement through their local laws. And please note, there are some key rights that apply were adopted by a state or not. The ETI base code, the Ethical Trading Initiative, is a simplified interpretation of core workers' rights as an aid for businesses and corporates and companies. The United Nations guiding principles provide an internationally agreed framework for understanding and acting on the duty of business in the field of human rights. And the Sustainable Development Goals are a set of goals with indicators that set a development framework to enable and measure the progress for all. So in summary, it's about human rights, labour standards, anti-corruption and environment. 11 of the 17 sustainable development goals are inextricably linked to human rights and the balance of well-being or the environment, i.e. protecting the planet for generations to come and by delivering zero carbon and respect to Mother Earth. It's about ethics, it's about a circular economy, it's about health and equity, and it's about environmental protection. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, then thanks to Glenn and Liz for that um, briefing. I, I, I think it's a really important um, area of work and a really interesting um, briefing and papers that you've provided to us. Um, can I just ask a, a couple of questions um, in relation, first of all, to the, the paper? Um, it, since you have adopted it, how, how, um, how much progress has been made in relation to the, the, uh, the, three, the three pillars within the paper? Um, and can I just ask about the access to remedy? Um, what is the, the, the access to remedy currently? Yeah. Um, maybe if I kick off and Glenn, Glenn might want to come in. Um, yeah, the, we've tried to be a practical forum. So in terms of implementing this, the, to give an example of a piece of, a piece of work we did, when we worked with the Department of Finance to produce the uh, uh, document on a procurement guidance notes and how you might embed human rights, we worked with the department on a pilot project um, for agency workers, an area where there's traditionally been um, difficulties and sometimes exploitation. Um, that was looking at how you embedded human rights. So it was about developing, saying to anybody who tended for the agency worker uh, particular competition that they would have to develop and maintain a human rights policy that had been approved at a board level that within 30 days of the award, they provide the human rights policy and demonstrate how its processes on human rights were written into and taken into account. So we've tried to, to do this in a very practical way. Um, it's worth saying in procurement that public contract regulations make it mandatory to, for example, reject abnormally low tenders if the low price is due to non-compliance with EU legislation or international law related to social labor or environmental law. So we've been pushing the idea 
but human rights should be fully embedded. We're at a very early stage. We have done some training with um, CPD staff. Um, so embedding the principles is, um, is one that we would like to devote more resources to. In terms of remedies, well, we do have remedies. We have industrial tribunals. Um, we have employment law. Um, we have other enforcement mechanisms. But the difficulty with transparency and supply chains is that it's about business reputation. If something happens in a country uh, where you're procuring um, uh, materials or labor and those labor laws are not being properly adhered to in, in another country, then it's much more difficult. And that's about then responsibility. Um, and that's probably a good note to bring Glenn in. Yes, thanks, Les. Uh, sure. Remedy is not about naming and shaming. When you're operating a global supply chain, it's about working in partnership with your producing factories, or in my case, producing quarries also, um, to raise their standards. You know, I go back to what I said earlier, human rights, labor standards, anti-corruption environment. Where those standards fall uh, beneath, say, for example, the ETI base code, uh, which is nine principles based on the ILO convention, it's about recognizing those and, and raising those standards. So it's about getting a third party audit completed and then working uh, with that supplier on a corrective action plan to raise them to the standards that uh, basically meeting the workers that uh, can work equitably and securely um, to, to what we would normally expect. Um, it is difficult. There is absolutely no doubt about it, you know, but it is now regulated for. If we look at Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, it calls for uh, ethical transparency within global supply chains. So it very much puts the responsibility on corporates and business, trading over 36 million to do that. Now, where we fall in, I mean, I'm, our business is an SME, uh, as in hard skin. But we obviously supply major works contractors. We obviously supply government and, and local authority. So it is the onus is on us to raise our standards, our bar, even though we don't meet the 36 million threshold, to actually assure that our, our supply chain is operating transparently. And for us, we began the process back in 2007 when we applied the Ethical Trading Initiative base code um, and started rolling that out. Then 2012, we had the United Nations Guiding Principles introduced. 2016, the Modern Slavery Act itself in, uh, in Britain. But the Modern Slavery Act was flawed initially. The Modern Slavery Act, for example, put a lot of uh, bonus on business. But for example, a local authority and, a, and a government themselves didn't have to adhere to it uh, until very recently. But the recent amendments at Westminster mean that such bodies do now have to adhere to the Modern Slavery Act. And there's much more onus being placed on exactly how do you measure that transparency. So, for example, giving an annual statement uh, drafted <clears throat> up by a, a very cute marketing department is no longer uh, going to be permitted. What you have to do is demonstrate in practice and by your actions how your company is actually engaged within the supply chain, whether well, that be a local supply chain sitting here in Belfast, or whether well, that be a global supply chain important from, for example, our own from China, India, Vietnam, Portugal, Italy, and so on and so forth. Um, so, but the, the, the key question in remedy is that it's not about naming and shaming, it's about cooperation, it's about joint ventures, it's about partnership, and it's about raising your supply chain to the standards that we would expect. That, that's really useful. Thank you for that. Um, it gives a good overview of it. Can I just ask, how um, would you envisage this work um, intersecting with uh, the Bill of Rights for, for here? Um, well, there are a number of um, potential overlaps between economic and social rights. It's fair to say that the UN guiding principles, for example, are not um, they are simply principles and they are about voluntarism. I think where we would see a Bill of Rights fitting in with this um, will be about looking at what are the areas where, I mean, bearing in mind Bill of Rights is um, to be the convention rights supplemented by 
um, other rights which are particular to the circumstances of Northern Ireland. So we're going to have to find a way in which anything that we look at in a Bill of Rights fits within the Good Friday Agreement um, conditions. But I think the important thing for us is to start thinking um, creatively and practically. I'm interested in, in what the um, European Court of Human Rights talk about rights should be real and practical, not theoretical and illusory. So I think us, we recognize that um, legislation is important, but you have to win the hearts and minds of businesses. You have to persuade businesses that it's in their interest to do this. So um, that's really where the work of the forum has been. Um, I think if we can build on that in the Bill of Rights, all well and good, but we've got to win people's hearts and minds in the first place. And that's not done primarily by legislation although that is a driver it's done by people realizing it's not just the right thing to do but that it's good for business to do this and, and glenn's company hardscape is a really good example of that uh sure i mean as people evolve i mean let, let's let's be frank and honest if we look around the public realm of northern ireland there is uh products and commodities being used that certainly I'm aware would have been made by children, would have come from supply chains where labor rights abuse has taken place. And that happens because of a lack of diligence. At the minute, the entire process for business is voluntarily, or is vo voluntary, um, but that's gonna change. The, the implementation of what's coming in the Modern Slavery Act is going to change that. People themselves are evolving people, the COVID crisis, I think, has, has made people realize, you know, we cannot keep damaging our planet and, and, and our resources. And there is a, a real drive that uh, corporate companies move beyond paper CSR to a demonstrable way in which they are um, not degrading human beings or the environment within either their own company operations or supply chain. And I think as that evolution takes place, um, which has already begun, we are going to see, specific to Northern Ireland, that our, our Bill of Rights, when they, they evolve and happen, happen will we'll have a, a social justice aspect to them, which will include um, corporate responsibilities, business responsibilities, um, to, to basically come in line with the Modern Slavery Act, Section 54. Uh, the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business Human Rights, you know, and, and how that happens, you know, certainly from our case, working to the UNGPs and the ATI base code, actually improved the commodities that we sell. We were able to improve tolerances because we were retaining uh, employment things, uh, the employment principles uh, and, and the, the, the value chain, and therefore we were getting longevity uh, people, because obviously it's masonry, so the skill set was improving. Um, so it's about a business recognizing that ultimately this is the future. SDG 30s are the future. It's about them defining their priorities, mapping their value chain. There's a lot of companies are great at their operations, but they don't know who their tier one, tier two, three, four, five suppliers are. So it's about them mapping their supply chain and defining the impact areas that they know. So for example, if you're important from Portugal or dealing with a supplier in Portugal, logically, because it's a European country where the ECHR prevails, you, your risk is minimal. But if you're important from China or India or Vietnam, the risk is huge, particularly from China, uh, You know, which despite the gloss is the worst human rights abuser on earth. Um, so it's defining how you can have impact, you know, put, real change into those impact areas and then modeling the scope of your goals so again coming back to china it's also a restricted country it's a, a communist country you know glenn bradley of little old hardscape in ireland going over and waving a, a flag and demanding change or insisting that you isn't going to get very far people who are working in labor rights advances and in human rights in china are being disappeared you know so we've got to be realistic of the country issue but it's about a business recognizing that, understanding that, saying 34% of our supply chain comes from China. Yes, there is a risk. This is how we have mitigated the risk. We can't get beyond tier one. So while we're satisfied that our producing factory in Xiamen 
is tickety boo. We actually can't guarantee it in the quarries because the quarries are state owned and we're not allowed to go into those quarries. And it's about being honest, it's about being transparent, and it's about doing it. But the initial setup is business accepting that this is the way of the future and that while it's present, the voluntary, that regulation is coming in. The main driver in our patch, Modern Slavery Act, Section 54, uh, transparency in the supply chain. But as the SDGs roll out, this will increase. If you think of the UK government yesterday, they have just committed to the to, to 10 serious principles um, in regard to the environment. Uh, but that will then happen with human rights, with, with labour standards and with anti-corruption, because those are the four components to the SDGs. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I, I think I, I, I agree with you, Glenn, in, in relation to, I think COVID has really shone a light on um, our, our need to be much more aware of um, how people act in general in terms of, of business and, um, you know, be more aware of all of the kind of supply chain issues and everything else as well and, um, and the impact that, that we are, uh, and how we live our lives has on the environment as well as, as um, public health. So I have lots of questions, but I have five more members wanting to come in as well. So I'm going to hand over to Stuart, if um, Stuart can hear me okay. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to both of you for your, for your presentation. When you say um, this is about developing good practice uh, uh, and not, um, not, not being... Uh, draconian in relation to human rights issues. Is that really not just mom and apple pie? Uh, and without actual action by governments and indeed by individual suppliers, um, are we ever going to drive forward the state of human rights and business in terms of slavery and, and in terms of, of, of uh, practices in countries with, with low or no uh, with, with low human rights practices. And you just have to look back on, on the whole issue of, of PPE and where all of it came from. Do we really know how it was manufactured, who it was made by? Were, were, were there people actually working in slave-like conditions? Were there children involved in, in, in all of that? Um, and while I appreciate that this is uh, all about trying to encourage and to highlight uh, what do you? What do we actually? What do we actually have to do uh, when abuses are highlighted either to a nation or to an individual supplier uh, in relation to this? Where are you getting your information from? Is it coming from people like Human Rights Watch and others that are um, identifying very difficult issues in factories and manufacturing processes? And if I can just briefly. Uh, reverse that discussion as well. What happens uh, when you're trying to supply your goods into these countries? How satisfied are you? Uh, how satisfied are we in the United Kingdom and particularly here in Northern Ireland that machinery or equipment <coughs> that is being exported isn't going to be you isn't going to be used by people who are being abused? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, if, if I start, sure, there's quite a few questions in there, so I'll try and <coughs> pick up some and then, <coughs> again, pass, pass you over to Glenn. Um, <coughs> I think the answer is, there is it has to be a mixture of both, a legislative, a robust legislative framework, but it has to be about hearts and minds. Um, and the reason I say that is we're much better at putting in place a legislative framework. We have the modern slavery act if you have a turnover of more than 36 million you have to put in certain documentation but the danger is that that can become formulaic and we think the job's done because we've we've put in place some legislation so it's clearly much more than that um the idea that selling to businesses that it's in their best interest to do this um it, i think it's really important because that tends to be i think what drives businesses I would be a glass half full. I really think it's important that the fact that government departments and its net arm's length bodies procure over 2.7 billion means that even in terms of our procurement processes, we can drive this forward in, the, in a way that's meaningful. We can give a message to business that says, if you want to do business with government, 
then you must adhere to human rights standards and principles. And we don't need legislation to, to drive that forward. And, and I'll give you a very quick example. Um, <clears throat> when I was on the Social Security Advisory Committee, somewhat embarrassingly from the Department for Work and Pensions, was that their window cleaning contract, uh, they discovered that something like half the staff were doing the double at a time when the DWP were talking at great length about tackling fraud in Social Security. Now, I suspect that was procured. I suspect the cheapest bid won it, but it was clearly using um, a lot of migrant labor and a lot of labor that um, uh, where there was a kind of tacit encouragement to people to both work and claim. Uh, that was pretty embarrassing for DWP. So um, it's really important that we get our um, procurement, <clears throat> procurement right. And I should say as well that these issues are not confined to the developing uh, nations. Um, we saw during the pandemic um, the issues about um, how some of the clothing uh, factories were run in Leicester. So modern slavery can begin at home um, as well as abroad. So I think those are kind of um, issues for us. And in terms then of where else you can, um, um, who highlights these issues, there are a number of NGOs. We have Trocare as a member who've done presentations about the work they've done elsewhere in exposing kind of labor issues. There are international organizations. There's the Ethical Trading Initiative. So there are a number of bodies, both state, um, UN, uh, the International Labor Organization, and NGOs who've done some really quite pioneering work in terms of exposing um, um, abuse abroad. And yes, finally, and then Glenn again, we need to be sure that we are, um, frankly, um, before we dictate to others how they should behave when they uh, supply chains into this country, we should make sure that our own supply chains and our goods, uh, where they go elsewhere, um, it's really important that there is a clarity about what our goods are being used for on the international market. And there are export license kind of arrangements and we've seen some recent legal action around, for example, the use of um, um, certain types of technology in, for example, in um, Middle Eastern countries then being used, for example, in the Yemen war. Um, and there've been some interesting kind of legal battles around, around those issues. So I'll, I'll hand over to, to Glenn. Um, as a businessman, <clears throat> I've got on with over 36 plus years working life experience as a logistician or as a commercial entrepreneur, the voluntary method has failed. Um, for me, it is time for more regulation. Um, as a business, we have been penalized for being ethical. And to put that into perspective, let me explain. Up until very recently, Northern Ireland's Central Procurement Department, as an example, operated on lowest cost wins. And against lowest cost wins, there was absolutely no ethical caveats whatsoever. So that meant that a business like ours, uh, who do trade ethically and who practice ethics, uh, will always be slightly more expensive because, for example, we ensure that within our own operations and within tier one of our supply chain, that living wages are paid. So how can a product that I sell be the same price as someone who's a ruthless exploiter using child labour. Yet, there was no, until very recently, ethical caveats whatsoever within the Central Procurement Department uh, for, for Northern Ireland and its purchases for public realm uh, over here. So to me, there needs to be more regulation. And by regulation, I don't necessarily mean law. I think laws will evolve, uh, particularly with the SDGs coming out from the UN and being adopted by all 193 member nations. But I do think that uh, um, like the procurement's guidance note uh, is an essential um, ingredient for government and for business to both uh, operate uh, in an ethical manner. Les briefly mentioned the Ethical Trading Initiative and um, it, it, you know, we, we are, our company, our leaders within the Ethical Trading Initiative, and I as an individual have been a, an activist involved with ETI since 1999. The ETI base code is quite simple, and it's based on the ILO convention. It's no forced labor. 
freedom of association and the rights to collective bargaining, safe and hygienic working conditions, child labour shall not be used, living wages are paid, working hours are not excessive, no discrimination is practised, regular employment is provided, and no harsh or inhumane treatment exists within the workplace. Now, I can confidently state that within our supply chain and our own operations, we have rolled all those principles out to tier one of our supply chain, i.e. the producing factories. In the cases of, say, for example, China, uh, where we, we do buy some stone because we're forced to, because of that lowest cost wins, we have to go there uh, to, to maintain profit and to stay in business. We can't get into the quarries. The government will let us. Um, because of how China also groups things together, they don't operate a single quarry system. So they commodity code everything. For example, G603 is silver grey granite. But that silver grey granite can come from upwards of 23 different quarries, of which I have absolutely no input as a businessman. And, and, and it's, it's about educating people. So it's, for me, regulation is, is the way forward. And a business that is practicing ethically and trading ethically and embracing the SDGs uh, for, the th for the future has absolutely nothing to fear. The only people in business that would have anything to fear from embracing human rights, labor standards, anti-corruption, and uh, the environment are those who are ruthless exploiters. And it is up to government where they come across ruthless exploiters to try and remove them in any way that they can, either by guidance notes or um, a through, through law. But going back to what I said earlier about the COVID crisis and how it has brought us to a, a, a I could put it, sense, the fact is that for the future, any business that degrades human beings or our environment must be stopped. And that begins with government leading by example because if we look at the UNGP, United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, protect, respect, remedy, protect is the nation's responsibility. The respect and remedy then falls down to the corporate company. So it actually begins, in my mind, with government. It's up to government to lead. And where government leads, as we know in not just this field, but in other fields, business will follow and, be, and, and support what the government is doing. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to move on then to, to Sinead and just to remind members um, that, that we do have two other our briefings and so if we can keep our remarks brief. Cheers. Sinead. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Sinead, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much both for your briefing uh, this morning. Uh, and Glenn, uh, I just want to pick up on, on what you said in relation to uh, responsible businesses. Businesses on the whole do want to be responsible. Um, however, uh, following voluntary um, activities around, uh, around uh, rights, is not the way to go. It has to be uh, written in legislation, and that's the way in order to, to make sure that uh, uh, the rights of all workers uh, and all products, etc., cetera, are, are respected. So um, that's a movement that I certainly would be um, upholding. Uh, the thing that I want to talk about, or the issue that I want to talk about, and perhaps uh, Les maybe can, can give me more information on this, is in relation to your document in Pillar 2, where you talk about uh, corporate responsibility in respect to human rights, and you're talking about developing a human rights-based approach in the publication and adoption of employment policies, and you actually specifically talk about gender equality. Uh, and also about childcare and family-friendly policy. Uh, I am particularly concerned about both of those at the moment as a result of COVID, um, because uh, you know women are more adversely affected in terms of jobs uh, and redundancies coming forward. And also we have seen um, childcare uh, policies uh, and, and childcare in, 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 in every aspect. Um, was was a very very difficult problem, and I think that there's an awful lot of um, rights 
in, 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 of women that are under under pressure at the moment. And, and I'm wondering, you know, are you specifically looking at this? Because I see as one of the key areas of <clears throat> is, uh, is about zero hour contracts uh, and how uh, people's rights are actually uh, blown out of, of the system. And, and sometimes, um, I know, Glenn, you are optimistic in terms that COVID has kind of shone a light on, on how we need to protect people. But sometimes when businesses are under pressure, um, they don't behave as well as we would like them to. So, the, you know, there are there are uh, particular sectors and particular groups of people that are under pressure at the moment as a result of that. And also then, uh, if I can really get you to reflect on what impact do you think Brexit is going to have on um, employment rights generally, uh, and basically human rights in particular. Uh, and we you talked, uh, uh, about uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, and what impact of us leaving um, the EU um, is that going to have uh, in development policy? And do you think that there's any appetite within the UK to actually diverge from some of the the human rights that were held within within the European Union? Sorry, that's an awful lot, but um, there is an awful lot in this document that I would really like to be interrogating a lot further. Uh <clears throat> Thanks, Sinead. I'll be brief. I'm, I'm conscious of time. So, uh, in terms of workplace, just to give you three quick examples of where um, we've looked at issues, uh, we had a presentation from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions on childcare as a workplace issue, uh, and there's a campaign on that about getting employers to be aware of those issues. We've looked at the responsibility, perhaps some might think quite surprisingly, but of employers to look at signs of domestic abuse so that there are issues around um, uh, if a woman uh, or anyone to that matter, but if a woman is being, uh, for example, a victim of domestic abuse, that you should be able to see the signs in the workplace because you may be able to help that woman um, and that's good for your own pro productivity, but it's the right thing to do. Many employers don't think of those issues as, as workplace issues. And we did um, a piece of work on <clears throat> looking at some best practice in the building industry around mental health of workers, particularly those who were sent away on contracts away from home and how work was done there. So those are workplace issues, and that's the kind of thing that we want to, to, to highlight. In terms of leaving the EU, I may uh, pick up that very quickly. The Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission will both become dedicated mechanisms when we leave the EU, that's about the protection of um, the rights, a bit of a mouthful, under the rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity section of the Good Friday Agreement. It also entails in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol um, that we will keep pace with certain areas of EU law, and it includes equal treatment in employment and self-employment, access to goods and services, and um, social security, and also uh, some non-discrimination EU provisions. So there are some safeguards that we have um, built into the Ireland, Northern Ireland protocol. So that's something that both ourselves and the Equality Commission will want to make sure are robustly monitored and, and maintained. And I'll hand over again to Greg, uh, to Glenn, sorry. Okay, thanks, uh, Les. Uh, Sinead, I mean, no discrimination is practiced, no harsh or inhumane treatment are the foundation stones of the ETI-based code. And within that comes about gender equality, gender recognition. And, and, and once a, a, a corporate signs up to the ETI-based code and begins the process of evolution, because there's four ranking stages in ETI, there's the baseline member, there's then the improver, achiever, and leader, and, and that's independently assessed on an annual basis as you go through the process. Um, so that's how I, as a corporate, uh, would be defining our, our workplace scenarios and, and what we're just talking about. But yes, I recognize that there are others who are ruthless exploiters within business. And I mean, we've seen it recently. Uh, I mean, Arcadia, what's happening with Debenhams and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. it's, it's horrendous. Yeah. In regards Brexit, uh, I don't think that, that for this committee I should be speaking on it. You know, I am a businessman who doesn't see any good out of Brexit. 
Um, for me, breakfast, a uh, breakfast, Brexit, um, <laughs> will annihilate the well-being um, of Northern Ireland PLC, and it has already uh, done a huge injustice to our company and its trading position. Uh, because people, particularly because I operate in the Republic of Ireland as well as the North, people, how could you put it, won't give us business because of fear of the supply chain being breached. We cannot give, at the minute, I cannot give supply chain assurances because of the incompetence of, of uh, what's happening in Westminster. So I wouldn't be someone who could comment on Brexit because purely as a businessman, I see no good Brexit. Um, thank you very much, Glenn uh, and Les, for that. Um, if we move on then to, to John O'Dowd, please. Uh, thank you, Glenn, Les. Uh, a very interesting presentation. And the fact that we have Glenn in front of us, who's a he's quarry operator, talking about human rights, I think is very enlightening and, and a welcome development uh, that, that industries are involved in this process and practice and trying to develop it uh, even further. So, well, well done to all involved. However, I have a slight question in my head. Well, I have a significant question in my head. Um, given the nature of and the relationship between Caterpillar, the company, and the Israeli army, and Caterpillar's and the Israeli army's activities in Palestine, how can the vice chair of your company be a, of the group be a representative of Caterpillar? Yeah, I think that was close to me, John. Um, <clears throat> look, you know, I understand that. I We took an early decision, and people can be critical of this um, as a commission, but do we set the bar high and simply talk to organizations and preach to the converted, or do we try and set a set of principles and then engage with companies um, and we took the decision that it would be better to do the latter. Um, I kind of, um, a, a quote of a former colleague of mine on the commission who used to quote Nye Bevan, which was um, uh, being pure yet impotent um, is probably not the way to go. So yes, I think you're quite right. There are, if, if we decided to try and do some kind of um, audit of every company before they could join the forum, I suspect we'd probably struggle to have many people sitting around the table and we'd be talking to those who are already converted. So that's the basis on which we've set the bar low and we feel it's more important to talk to companies and persuade them rather than exclude them from a conversation. Well, well I accept if, if the purpose is to convert, then that, that, that's a noble cause um, and I wish you well with it. Uh, I'm not sure... Well, how and who you elect as chair and vice chair of your grouping is a matter for yourselves. Um, but I, I do hope the emphasis is on conversion with a number of them. But on another matter, um, Les, I think you touched on the basis that you had engagement with students and universities. Could you elaborate on that a bit further, please? Um, yeah, well, uh, um, both uh, Glenn and I have been very involved. We we had a series of annual kind of debates uh, from the business schools of both universities to and um, would set kind of tasks. The, we now have a module with the Queen's University Business School, which is kind of three separate sessions. It's a voluntary commitment, but a number of students do this, which looks at human rights and business and the global framework and how, again, uh, human rights can play a role in business. Um, and I've been quite, it's, it's just about to start its second year. Um, and we've had a number of students who've gone through that. But what we see, I think, is that when students are at business schools at the two main universities, what we want to do is make sure that students are exposed and have the opportunity to hear about uh, business and human rights. It's not something that's generally embedded into the curriculum of business schools. So um, it's, a, it's about, starting that kind of conversation to make sure that uh, human rights is embedded in, in both um, study as well as in practice. Okay. Is, yeah. is there any engagement with the colleges, Liz, uh, with the further higher, or the higher education colleges? 
Um, no, we haven't had an opportunity to do that. And there's a kind of resource limitation um, in practice. We'd love to be able to do a great deal more than we currently can. But in practice, given we're a small organization, that's just not been possible. Okay, thank uh, you. Sorry. John, the, uh, the Business and Human Rights Student Ambassador Program that takes place at Queen's, I know that they certainly invite uh, Ulster University along to that. And I, I, Les and I, Zara and other members have been along to every meeting. And basically the purpose of the program um, is to equip the students with the knowledge, the basic knowledge and skills to act as ambassadors to promote ethics and human rights within business during both their academic studies um, and their future professional careers. So it's, it's really about getting them early and, and that, eradicating that ignorance that exists around business and human rights and labor standards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so that they can progress with that knowledge safely throughout the rest of their professional careers. But certainly during the, the business and human rights student ambassador program, it's open to both Queens and Ulster University, although it is hosted up at Riddle Hall at Queens. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring Claire in, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Les and Glenn. Um, I, I suppose with um, with uh, modern slavery and, and I suppose even human trafficking, it's as much about you know what's happening on the ground and what people's perceptions of it are. You know, and, and we all know that you know some people wouldn't even recognise that they are either being trafficked or, or or they are you know being taken advantage of. And I suppose I, I was speaking to an ethnic uh, minority uh, group uh, quite recently, um, and they had suggested to me that it's it's practical things um, that are happening which which is giving rise to them being exploited um, you know so for example and I don't know how you know I, I can't confirm this and, and maybe you can but for example we're the only region of the UK where people cannot get a national insurance card or number and that's quite concerning because then that means they can't work legally and then they can't provide for their family and all those practical things that they do um, or, you know or that they are pursuing or people are exploiting them is, is for the basis of trying to to, to earn and, and, and get food on the table so I suppose it, are there any other examples and particularly to Northern Ireland because apparently this is a very specific um, issue that, that you're familiar with that we could be doing better here to so that we're not almost setting the context in which people are being allowed uh, to, to be treated in this way um, I, I'll give you one one small example I, I, I'm not familiar with the the national insurance issue I mean there are um, we have separate legislation about getting a national insurance number. I wasn't aware that it was different from, from um, the rest of the UK. I'll give you one small thing that could be done. I was very impressed when um, I had a presentation at the forum where in Scotland, for example, every police officer has a small laminated card with six signs of human trafficking. So if, for example, you visit a house in multiple occupation and you have a lot of people living in under one roof, um, what you might look out for if you're visiting because of a, a, a domestic incident or whatever. Um, that's the kind of, you know, it was a kind of end of training and a very simple kind of method. Those are the kind of practical things we could do here. Um, one of the ways in which um, an issue came to the attention, um, I know, was, for example, in Keeley in County Armagh some years ago, a group of people were standing at 6.30 in the morning waiting for a bus, just waiting by the side of the road. And a member of the public drove past, saw them at half six, drove back again at the end of work 10, 12 hours later, and they were all still standing there and rang the police to say this is a very odd thing. Mm. And what had happened was that the bus to pick up these migrant um, workers to take them to work hadn't turned up. And they were so uh, cowed, if you like, and defer deferential that they didn't know what to do. Now, those are the kind of things that we could be more aware of. So a lot of this is about general awareness of, of the issues. And if we're aware as the public, so I think there's things that we can do both in the Department of Justice and beyond, and we should tie those initiatives across government departments. No, Les, I, I agree with that because I think as well, you know, you make a really important point that you know whether it's you know, people locally or or people who who are coming to Northern Ireland, they don't recognise that they are actually being exploited because, crudely, the, the standards that existed in, in the, their homes where they came from were perhaps less than even the standards that are here. But that doesn't make them right in Northern Ireland, and that doesn't mean that you know anyone else, you know. That, 
because other people who are not subject to those same standards, therefore they shouldn't be either. So I think it's about trying to maybe encourage some sort of communication around um, what it actually is and what it looks like on the ground, because it isn't that typical kind of stereotypical thing that we that we tend to think of when we think of, of, of modern slavery or human trafficking. And, you know, I would say there, were, there are an awful lot of people who will be surprised that some of the services perhaps that they are using are actually being um, uh, staffed by, by people who, who are... Um, you're being exploited and, and I think we need to get that message out there more clearly because when we talk about this you know you're right it, it, it is happening in the UK it's happening in, in, in GB but it's happening in Northern Ireland and I would think an awful lot of people might be quite shocked to learn what it looks like and you know and that's that's employers as well as consumers um, too so I you know I, I think we need to do more in that respect and you know and starting from a business perspective and calling out is, is a good place to start. Claire, I mean, coming back to what, uh, as a business we do, and I spoke briefly about it earlier, it's about mapping your supply chain, understanding mm -hmm. your company operation in tier one, two, two, three, right down until you're, in my case, I'm talking about the guy who's manufacturing the crates mm -hmm. that the stone goes into to bring the modules onto the shipping container. Yeah. It's about understanding that yeah. on the more local front, if we do think about human trafficking, how many of us have been to a car wash that's £2.50? that uh, potentially is being operated by people that have been trafficked. You know, and it, it's about due diligence. It's about your own personal due diligence. And then in our sphere, it's about the wider business due diligence. And it comes back to that drill that I'm always saying, the four points, labor standards, human rights, anti-corruption, and environmental due diligence. And the due diligence needs, kind of with what she had said earlier, and myself, it needs to be regulated. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we we'll move on then to Christopher, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, before I became a member here, uh, one of the issues that I actually worked on in a sort of backroom capacity was the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill uh, that uh, the Lord Morrow put through. I think a big part of um, those provisions that are there. Uh, can alleviate the problems of suffering, the suffering that's caused by human trafficking and forced servitude and uh, sexual exploitation. I think it requires the police to use the provisions and to to actively go after um, go after those who are engaged in that criminal activity. So, uh, I wonder if you could talk to that for me for a minute in terms of enforcement. And I just want to place on the record. I think that Caterpillar are a valued local employer yeah. and I think it's dangerous when a member of the committee says that Caterpillar needs to be converted away from trading in a country. I don't want us to be dangerously close to BDS territory there and I want no part of that. I Israel. didn't ask you to support it. I was making a comment. If well, you don't wish I, to support it, that's okay. Well, I would suggest that workers in Israel mm. have more rights than they do uh, in the countries that neighbour Israel, particularly mm. female workers. Israel is a democratic state. And I would suggest to you that the human rights regime that, that pertains in Israel is a lot more progressive than that which pertains in the countries around it. The problem so is, is the human rights record in Palestine. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about. Well, I just think, well, I just think it's important that... An alternative viewpoint is put on the record on that, but um, let's not get into the Israel-Palestine dispute because we could be here all year. Um, but I think uh, if you could just talk to, in terms of at home, the legislative provisions that we have, how um, you see enforcement in terms of trying to just stamp out on this sort of activity, and I suppose better education in terms of local companies being aware of the provisions that are there. Yeah, um, briefly, first of all, I think Lord Morrow's, uh, to Lord Morrow's great credit, the um, campaign he fought to get the, the bill and um, Aunt Claire and her departmental colleagues, it's something we worked very closely with Lord Morrow on in my time in the Law Centre. In terms of enforcement, there are some issues around. Um, in terms of having statements and, and having a turnover of more than 36 million, we know that um, many small businesses in Northern Ireland have a much smaller turnover than that. We are uh, an economy of small business. Mm. So there are some issues in terms of the legislation and, um, and those who have a 
turnover of more than 36 million. We have lots of examples of, as I said earlier, a kind of formulaic response. There's almost, um, so we have to kind of move beyond that. In terms of enforcement, um, of course, you've got to be aware of it. And it is about consumer power. It is about um, making the public aware. And then it's about taking action. One issue I would mention, and we've seen this before, that um, those who are sometimes trafficked or, or in modern slavery then be become treated as um, part of the immigration system rather than um, looked at as being somebody who's been exploited through through slavery. Yeah. Um, things have improved at times, but that's still a major issue that we look at this through the immigration prism and not through the exploitation prism. And my other issue of enforcement, and I know this again from from both commission and, and uh, law center days, we had examples of um, exploitation and it raised issues of employment law, criminal law, immigration law, uh, finding um, solicitors firms that know all the aspects of this so that you can deal with it holistically is quite difficult. I think we're getting better. There are more firms dealing, for example, with immigration law now. Um, so we probably in an ideal world should have some specialist resource that can deal with uh, with this um, because otherwise if you want to tackle all of the issues then you really need to have a range of skills that aren't always in one place mm. thank you um i would just um i would just like to I reiterate some of what Les said, you know, what Lord Morrow did uh, in starting the ball rolling. I mean, Northern Ireland at that time was ahead of the game in Britain, certainly in, in doing that. Obviously, it focuses very much on the human trafficking side of, of uh, the Modern Slavery Act, whereas I come at things more from a transparency of supply chains and responsible procurement and to, to, to the Modern Slavery Act. Um, but yes, I would just like to, to, to reiterate, or certainly from, from my endeavours, my thanks to Lord Morrow for what he did. On the thing to do with Barbara uh, being vice chair, Caterpillar, and so on and so forth, um, I said it earlier, it, our aim is not about naming and shaming. You know, the forum is about promoting human rights through business and working relationships. It's about encouraging the promotion and fulfillment of human rights in the workplace and supply chains. It's about facilitating the participation of employees and their representatives in measures to promote and fulfill human rights. It's about resolving to listen and seek the views of our stakeholders. And it's about sharing good practice and experience on respecting and protecting human rights. And, and certainly Barbara as an individual has been an invaluable vice chair uh, to me, uh, regardless of the company that em employs her. Um, but just to, to, to say that, you know, my angle uh, to all this is very much on the supply chain transparency and responsible procurement, whereas Les can deal with the human trafficking side of things. Thank you. Can we bring the chair back into the spotlight, please? Mike was doing something funny there. <laughs> Apologies. Um, Les and Glenn, thank you both very much for your briefing. And as I said, I know I certainly have um, many more questions that I'd like to kind of discuss with you, but we are a little bit tight for time today. So um, Peter was suggesting that perhaps if we could arrange for a, an informal briefing with yourselves as well, if you would be willing for the committee. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Any, anytime, Kiva, you know I'm here. Chair, yeah. we'll, we'll go ahead and, and organise that briefing then. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on then to our, our next briefing. Um, with it, um... oh, oh. Chair appears to have frozen. Um, can we bring Richard Ramsey into the spotlight, please? Richard, can you see us? Uh, yes. 
Um, the, the, the Good chairs, morning, everybody. Sorry, Richard. The chair's feed has just frozen. Can we bring the chair back into the spotlight, please? Thanks. Chair, can you hear us? Sinead, can you hear us? <laughs> Deputy Chair, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes, um, I can. We, we seem to have lost the Chair. Can I just ask you to step in and introduce Richard Ramsey, um, item five on the agenda? OK. Um, Members of the committee has agreed to keep a briefing from the economy to gain greater understanding of the recently announced voucher based scheme in order to help uh, stimulate the local economy. And we're going to hear this morning from Chief Economist of Ulster Bank, Richard Ramsey, who's no stranger to this committee. And uh, I think we'll just hand over to him now to make his opening statement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Chair. I, I suppose what I want to do just uh, to begin with is kind of con contextualise how we got to uh, this place where we're talking about high street vouchers. And I suppose if we think of the last, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the policies that uh, were played, first of all, you had the central bank, the Bank of England, slash interest rates uh, eventually from five, five and three quarter percent to 0.5 which was a, a lowest level in over 300 years. Uh, you also had a VAT cut, a temporary VAT cut from 17.5% to 15%, which then was subsequently increased to 20%. That was kind of uh, flat rate uh, across uh, everybody, wasn't targeted at, at all. And I suppose if you think back to those policies, the interest rate uh, reduction led to uh, people with mortgages, benefiting to the tune of hundreds of pounds uh, per month, uh, better off because of that. That's only if you had a, had a mortgage or a, house, a household and you had it linked to, uh, if it was a variable rate mortgage, but if you're in the private rented sector, you didn't benefit from that. Similarly, with the VAT cuts, uh, those people who were on lower incomes tended to spend the higher proportion of their money on uh, non vatable or low vatable goods, so they tended not to sort of benefit from the uh, that as much as other people. So the back cut was a blunt instrument. If you now look at where we're at at the minute, interest rates are pretty much uh, on the floor. They've been reduced from 0.75% uh, to 0.1%. So the economy hasn't got the lift that it got uh, previously. And what you're seeing, the emphasis is more on fiscal policy, so spending and tax, uh, tax cuts, but mostly more spending. We've seen the back cut again, but this time round it has been more targeted, where you've had the, the temporary reduction in the, uh, the big fat for the hospitality sector and tourism, etc. Et uh, and that tends to be the theme of where we've gone to, where the support has been more targeted, trying to target those specific sectors that have been hit hardest. Vouchers has then come on our sort of radar with the Eat Out, Help Out scheme. And uh, it wasn't means tested, it was available for, for everybody. And uh, Northern Ireland had the highest uptake of uh, per capita of, of that scheme than anywhere else in, in, in the UK. So clearly it, ha had a, it, uh, it worked in terms of stimulating uh, the economy uh, back then. What was interesting about the Eat Out, Help Out scheme was that you still had to pay some some money, you didn't go in and get your meal paid for free, it was, it was a discount. So essentially what the, the theme of that is, that it was leveraging more spend from the people uh, attending uh, to do that. And uh, so that's the sort of context there. Then we come to the high street and we're all aware of uh, the difficulties that the, the high street has, has been in. And the idea of sort of voucher schemes, and indeed we see uh, in the likes of Australia at the minute, they're introducing voucher schemes, uh, very targeted, whether it's for the tourism hospitality sector, whether it's $100, $50 discount vouchers off hotel uses and stuff because it's their, their summer season at the minute. But they're also doing some kind of shopping vouchers uh, and they are very targeted. So what they are doing in the likes of Melbourne is uh, they're actually doing it as a kind of 
competition or giving out vouchers for a specific market area. That's how localised it is. So it would be the equivalent of, say, having vouchers for St George's Market, uh, uh, for the sake of argument. So I suppose we again come to the high street, high street voucher scheme for Northern Ireland. I'm not aware of the details of how it exactly it's designed or could or, or, or would work. But what I want to do is just give you some thoughts on the economic rationale of uh, why it could be a good uh, idea, what you could do to improve it, maximise its usefulness and, and all of those kind of things. So I suppose in terms of if we think uh, initially for the voucher scheme, what you wouldn't want it to be, you would want it to be targeted at those businesses that have been hit uh, hardest. So there would be what you've seen in Northern Ireland. There's been some retailers have done uh, uh, relatively well. Some have done uh, ex ex extremely well, uh, whereas others haven't. And it's those ones which have been suffered under the various lockdown restrictions would be uh, at face value uh, more uh, uh, it, it should be where the uh, support should be targeted at more than others. So you wouldn't want to have a Northern Ireland retail scheme because if you had a budget of 95 million, that's going to be diluted across, and the actual added uh, sort of like benefit of that uh, is is going to be minimised. Because what you want in terms of this is to try and encourage people uh, to to do what they wouldn't normally do in the absence of a, a sort of stimulus or an incentive. And I think what you have to bear in mind is what's happened with the consumer. We've, it's been largely split into two camps where we've had some consumers uh, who haven't lost their jobs, they uh, have been working from home and actually their bank balances have actually been rising and they've actually more money to spend, uh, but they just don't have the opportunity to spend because of lockdowns, etc. So there is a lot of bent up demand there. Conversely, you've got those people who've been furloughed or who've lost their jobs and uh, uh, they have lost their ability to spend. So even whenever you have lockdown restrictions lifted, etc., you're going to see a lack of stimulus or you're going to see a lack of demand coming uh, from, from that group. So, uh, so I suppose if... If, you're do, if the, you do nothing and there's no vouchers whatsoever, what I would anticipate happening whenever the lockdown restrictions and, uh, lift and we get closer to whatever the vaccines roll out and things like that, so we get into the kind of March, Easter time, et cetera, like that, you will see pent-up demand returning, particularly those people who uh, have uh, had their incomes protected and have this pent-up demand, so that will happen anyway. Where you're going to see the, the difficulties is for the other group of people where that demand isn't going to be there. So what can be stimulated? Uh, how can you do that? If you were giving, uh, say, for example, the policy tools which are available to the, the executives, if you took the likes of uh, rates policy, domestic rates, and you just reduced domestic rates for sake of argument by £200, that money could be saved. Uh, the money could be spent, but not in a way that helps the high street. It could be just spent online. It could be just spent uh, on uh, anything else. Plus, you would have people in rented accommodation wouldn't benefit that. So you have limited policy tools at your disposal to do anything other than do consider schemes uh, such as this. So then in terms of what what is it designed to do, you're designed to get uh, people out to uh, spend money, particularly it would be most beneficial for those who don't have their uh, savings built up uh, on the back of this crisis and how they can stimulate the high street and whether it's targeted, time bound, whether it's voucher, uh, whether it's, uh, and the thing is, it's, if it's a voucher as opposed to cash, it actually guarantees a transaction where there's actually economic uh, activity is generated, where if it's just uh, cash, they can spend it on somebody else save it but it's also the key benefits in this is going to be how can you how well can you target it because if you do give it to everybody and it's not means tested it's like a need out the help out scheme i suppose the issue there is that you then have people who otherwise would have spent money don't need don't need to do that because they've now got a, a voucher but the benefits of doing that even though there are downsides with that because you would argue that they, they don't need it uh, would be that it, it's then encouraging people to spend money 
uh, in the shops rather than uh, online on, on, on that sense. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of broad terms uh, about it. And I suppose ultimately what the policy, what, what policymakers are going to have to come down to is if they have a the likes of the budget of 85 mi or 95 million, what is the opportunity cost of this? What is the specific area they want to target? And is there, can they achieve better outcomes in any other ways? And that's kind of what's uh, op open for consideration and ultimately what uh, the Department for the Economy is, is going to have to make a judgment on. Um, Richard, thank you very much for that. It's a really helpful overview um, and kind of some food for thought there as well in, in respect of it. Um, you mentioned the, the model in Australia and obviously there's also examples in um, Jersey and Malta that, that we're aware of um, and Peter has given us some information around those models to kind of compare and contrast what, what they did. I think that the, the Maltese version was was a little bit, sounds certainly a little bit like the, the Australian version that you spoke there, where it's very targeted and, and localised, and, and the Jersey model was um, a slightly less targeted. It's kind of a, a prepaid card thing as well. Um, so I guess we're kind of just trying to get... Um, a feel for what is possible and um, we're not entirely sure of in that respect yet in terms of what the department's thinking is in, around it and, and we are getting a briefing after yourself from, from the officials. Um, so I guess some of it in terms of what our, from our perspective, is it's a bit of a blank page, but we're trying to get an idea of what might be the best way to, to do things. Um, and I, I think that you, you mentioned um, the you know how to direct this, how to target it, at what retailers you might target it at, um, and then I, I suppose on the flip side of that, there might be an argument about giving consumers the choice and how they want to spend that themselves as well, um, and it, you know it's still generating income, still generating spend, and potentially additional spend to what what people might be be intending to do. Um, so it would just maybe get your thoughts around if you have any insight or um, around any of the other schemes, the effectiveness of them in, in the likes of Jersey or Malta or, or Australia, how, how those have um, have played out and that kind of, I suppose, competing interest in respect of directing it and targeting it at, at potential particular retailers, but also giving people the, the opportunity to spend it how they might like to spend it as well, because we are very conscious of those people who have really difficult financial circumstances at the minute are and you know really struggling, um, and that they may, for example, want to spend it on on groceries or something like that, as opposed to you know what potentially more luxury items or, or things that you know are those kind of shops that are also really struggling at the minute. So, um, just yeah, a couple of questions. I, I think that. I think that ultimately comes back to what is the aim of the policy, because if you have a fund to generate the high street, uh, because certainly, uh, you know, we're all aware, well aware of uh, uh, the difficulties that many families and individuals find themselves in and not being able to afford groceries and stuff. So it's almost, is it this policy to do that? If so, do you make it some sort of hybrid policy where it's the high street and it's uh, you know, to uh, be almost like means tested. Do you link in with Department for Communities? Are you looking at then should it be skewed towards people who are on universal credit, for example? Those are kind of issues you can explore. I suppose the issue then would be though, to what extent are, if it's people with groceries, is this uh, people who have those difficulties, is that something that you should be letting other departments deal with separately and what you're doing is you're focusing on the economy perspective but is there a way of linking the two together for example and having those people who are more in need that it's actually they have uh, vouchers to uh, avail of the high street to buy things that they otherwise could not afford which aren't, aren't groceries as such but whether it's children's clothing shoes or things like that 
which still has the benefit of uh, it kind of stimul stimulating uh, the economy in that way. I know for some of the things, uh, like in uh, Australia, some of the schemes that they've done and the kind of travel vouchers and the discounts in hotels, uh, accommodation and things like that, uh, some of the ones that they have been disappointed with the uptake. And I suppose that's a case of, you know, ultimately what you want to do is you're trying to turn up a dial of how do you support uh, the high street? Do you go too big and too large where you give uh, you know, a significant amount of money to, uh, to all households and individuals and it ended up, you, you could have got the, uh, a, a more uh, efficient uh, result impact by actually giving them less, they would have been incentivized or not. So some of, the, some of the evidence suggests in Australia that maybe the incentives and the amount that they are giving is maybe not sufficient because some of the vouchers, hundred dollars, roughly say fifty pounds, you know, isn't enough for on the accommodation tourism side. But you know, ultimately, that's when you're designing this policy. It's how how do you do it, and it, it's not easy. But then, do you then look at how because some other things that they've done in in, in Australia is they've had vouchers for households and maybe been given four vouchers, two for. Uh, like kind of restaurants and eateries, etc., and another two for like entertainment, whether it's bowling alleys and things like that, and they can use those of that. So it's actually breaking it down and encouraging uh, spend in in uh, cert certain areas. So, but uh, yes, there's also the idea of what, what you said is almost like people voting with their feet if they actually give vouchers that they could go and. Um, uh, almost benefit the uh, local high street or shop that they have some sort of affinity with, uh, or it's useful in that regard. But again, I would say if it comes back to, do you want people to be spending this on petrol, diesel, groceries, all of those sort of things that essentially they would have been spending anyway? Uh, yes, if you're uh, on low incomes, that's seen as a benefit, but should you be looking at that elsewhere? But really what you want to do is stimulate demand elsewhere. And I think one of the key things is going to be timing this policy. So notwithstanding the kind of various health issues of virus control and when is the best time to do it. As I mentioned earlier, that there's this, there is going to be pent up demand coming in, particularly from those people uh, whenever the high street does open up, there is going to be pent up demand coming in. So. In an ideal world, you don't want to be throwing money at those people who are coming anyway. It's and whether how do you time it where it's uh, coming in maybe after that initial thing, so there isn't just, for example, like the property market at the minute where it's seen a bit of a boom, but it's going to then tail off next year. Uh, do you time it in a different way, or do you break down the vouchers to actually give them a first instalment, one of two instalments, first instalment initially? Where you can assess how it kind of went, and then another three months down the line, then go again, and, and that's sort the of way. So those are just some of the, the kind of thoughts I have on that. Okay, th thanks for that, way, Richard. Um, and actually, I think that's a, an important point around the timing of it. Is something we'll, we'll explore with officials too. Um, and I, I think there's some interesting ideas there about, you know. Well, as this team, you know, potentially things that could be done later as well in respect of other sectors, and and there was the announcement previously um, in the year around the tourism voucher. So again, that's something that we'll we'll want to explore. Um, and I think you know, it's, it is just an, an interesting debate and discussion about kind of what the policy um, intent is um, and how to best direct that. So um, I think that that has been useful, and I think there is other people wanting to come in. I think Stuart is first. Stuart. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Richard. I suppose at this stage uh, we need to try and tease out what the actual purpose of the scheme is. What, what's trying to be achieved here? Is this about um, trying to stimulate the economy, or is it trying to give uh, funds to individual citizens? Um, as a means to do that, um, some of that, some of the devil will be in the detail when we get departmental officials coming to to, to actually start to to describe the scheme to us. Um, 
just some of the initial thoughts and things that you, you, you've been saying. You know, um, if this is about trying to stimulate the economy, then why do we not just simply give that money to uh, retail businesses in the way in which we've been doing uh, previously in the, in the current pandemic, like uh, in rates relief, that's a fairly instant hit to people, um, and it puts money, uh, it, it saves them having to pay that money out and, and retains money within their business. Or is it about putting money into the hands of the citizen? And if that's the case, then, you know, hotel vouchers, um, eat out to help out vouchers, those really don't... I, I have constituents who couldn't eat out to help out because they depend on food banks. And very many of them have never been in a hotel as a guest. They've only been in a hotel perhaps as a kitchen porter or worker. Uh, so we need to be very careful when we start to, to, to target um, th those types of individuals. Uh, today, for example, we've seen Tesco's nationally hand millions of pounds back to the government because they were because although they were entitled to receive uh, various reliefs, uh, I, I think probably on rates um, uh, and other uh, community type charges. Um, so. You know, are we going to put the hands, put the money in the hands of the large high street retailers? Again, it's about what is it we're trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve uh, some sort of uh, financial stimulus uh, to, to to our high streets and traders, or are we trying to give money to the public to 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 get a benefit out of it? Or maybe it's both of those things that we're we're, we're trying to do. Um, and it, it's, I mean, for example, it's been it's been said today by by, by at least one person that the state has been uh, strangling uh, and destroying livelihoods. Is that really the reality of where we're at in Northern Ireland, or are we actually trying to defeat a very serious health pandemic? First of all, whenever you're talking about the uh, rates relief, and I, I saw that about uh, Tesco having the money back in. Northern Ireland, the rates relief did have exclusions where it was more targeted as who was uh, able to avail of that. You also have to remember that you can't, the, the finance minister has also extended uh, rates relief uh, well into uh, uh, the end of next year, I, I think it is. So businesses aren't, you cannot get any more rate relief for those businesses. That's a cost. Their problem is actually getting an income. If you just give them another grant, they don't have to be open. They don't have to do anything. No economic transaction has to actually take place. Their employees don't need to be there. Uh, you know, so what this is, what you want to do when stimulating the high street is you want to stimulate, stimulate activity. Well, with the likes of, say, if it's hotel vouchers or restaurant vouchers or things like that, where it actually means that. Uh, the demand does come back. There's food producers and the supply chain, which is involved in supplying that restaurant or cafe. They're all, uh, that all keeps moving and it doesn't grind to a halt. Whereas if you just give relief or you know, even just give a cash grant, that doesn't necessarily guarantee or incentivize uh, that anything positive from an economic activity or transaction point of view uh, actually uh, takes place. But on that basis, the, 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 help out, the, the need out to help out, uh, arguably, uh, was a massive contributor to the second wave of coronavirus. So timing will be essential in relation to when this type of funding would be rolled out. The last thing we want to do is have a contribution to a third or fourth wave of a very, very serious illness. Absolutely. Uh, the timing, is, timing is key. And it's also inter interesting, if you think of the Eat Out the Help Out scheme, it was, there were restrictions in the time of when it could be used, so it was not at the weekend. Um, ultimately, well, you can end up introducing so many caveats and so many rules and regulations with the scheme that you make it very difficult to actually implement. But, you know, that could be targeted, or whether it's even staggered, where certain households or individuals would get their vouchers at a certain time and other people would get it a few weeks later and, and things like that. But obviously, health concerns uh, are, an, uh, are an issue which uh, have to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stuart. Um, can we bring in Gordon, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, Richard, um, 
As I see it, I believe it, you know, it should be seen as an economic stimulus about uh, trying to stimulate the economy. And I think it's a great time. Let's be positive about the economy and about our country. The news that we got today about the vaccine now being approved and being accredited and has now been available or will be available shortly, I think it's great news. And, and all of this should be, can be seen as a positive um, factor. And I want to see um, the economy growing, growing and starting to turn the corner uh, after all the restrictions has been, which have been necessary. And um, otherwise they wouldn't be there. They were necessary because of a health ep epidemic that had to be addressed. Um, but I believe it, you know, it's there to stimulate the economy. The issue about means testing, I think, uh, I don't believe it should be means tested. I think there's this, always this uh, argument that uh, working families who are, are living on the limits and have not much spare money t to, uh, to go around, those families, I think, obviously would, would, would receive that support. In many ways are excluded from support. And there's been considerable support for such for other families through the Department of Communities, and that's been welcome and, and well received and, and focused on those in need. But I think it's uh, it, it's a real opportunity for everyone, everyone to get to get a voucher and to get out there and to spend and to boost the local economy. Come probably it'll probably be the springtime. How it's managed is going to be a challenge. Um, whether we can restrict it to the high streets, personally, I do think the like of the business parks, who have done well out of the restrictions and generally have been open, and where people can drive to, and we all do it, all drive to, pick up your, your goods and, 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 and go back home again. Those areas you wonder, but I, I, how it can be managed in a fair way uh, you do see that it needs to be a real focus on the high street. Those independent businesses that today are closed, while the multinationals around our towns are open, there are people, and we all have got it, you know, the feedback on relation to that, that they feel that it's unfair. Um, my other points, just a couple of other points, um, Richard, while you're there, um, there seems to be a lot of positivity in relation to the construction industry. I've got a report here from the, the Belfast Telegraph business section. They're talking about North Stone construction giant reports 11.7 million pound profit this year, in the past year. Um, boss of North Stone NA, parent says, parent company says all furlough support has been repaid. So mm. just like your thoughts on that. Uh, the other point that we get feedback from estate agents is the issue of the limit on mortgages for, for first-time buyers, where they're limited to 80%. Now, a family buying a house at 160000 would need around £24,000 deposit. That's a real challenge, especially for young people. So is there any flexibility there in relation to uh, mortgage lenders, including the, the Ulster Bank? Mm -hmm. I'd like your thoughts on that. Thanks, Chair. Well, in, ter in, ter in terms of the maximum load to value uh, that is uh, the deposits that are required, I think it's about eighty-five percent is what a lot of lenders, including ourselves, are, are offering. One of the issues from the last crisis was that uh, the uh, loan to values or the maximum amount was viewed as too high, and that was what the regulators said and came back and told the banks that they would have to account for that going forward. So in many ways, I suppose it's this idea of uh, responsible lending and responsible borrowing. And what we do have uh, in Northern Ireland is a buoyant co-ownership uh, segment, which uh, the requirements for the deposit are, are, are more attractive for, for people in terms of they have to pay uh, less of a deposit uh, to get on the property ladder. So there's those opportunities as well. Just in terms of the construction market as well, I would be careful in just uh, sing uh, singling out a single firm because and what we're seeing with the construction market is, and with the construction industry, it has been doing relatively well given the pipeline of work that has been coming in for the last few years. What I would be concerned about, about with construction is the pipeline of work going forward. And so while things appear 
Bird and Rosie now. It's when we go into uh, 2021 uh, and, and beyond, that work just isn't coming in to keep up to, to keep up the uh, orders. But why wouldn't it come in? You know, if government contracts are are being progressed, and why would why would it not come in? I appreciate COVID has had an effect, but a lot of construction work, and we, we all see it in our constituency, especially in the housing sector, has continued. Yeah, but the housing, even if you look at the, the housing market, there has been a rebound in house building. But uh, even this year, you've still had about 1,200 fewer houses built in the first uh, uh, nine months of this year relative to last year because there was the disruption, uh, disruption because of uh, COVID, etc. So. That's the same when you look at property transactions as well. While estate agents are saying things are extremely buoyant, in October we had more transactions in, a, in the month of October, uh, the, highest, the best October for 14 years. For the year as a whole, transactions are still down over a quarter. So we're only seeing that three quarters of what was passed through last year. So there is reduced, reduced flow uh, kind of going through uh, as well. Clearly, a lot of the, the demand and the sort of um, from uh, GB and in terms of some of the, the building uh, capital investment that was announced for for house building in, in GB will be one that uh, construction firms here can, can avail of an opportunity there. But my own sense, speaking with the industry as well, is that they're concerned about pipe, the pipeline going forward for the, for the next couple of years. Okay. Just on the, on the mortgage thing, Chair, just finally, uh, are you aware of the government announced scheme in, in the mainland? The Prime Minister was pushing it, where there was a, a government guaranteed scheme for first time buyers, where they would possibly get 90%, 95% mortgages. Is there any indication that that will apply to Northern Ireland? I'm not sure that that's actually, I, I'm, I'm aware that that was what the Prime Minister said, but I'm not aware that that has actually then come into being yet as a specific policy. It was it was flagged, but it's yeah. not something that I've seen any further follow-up on uh, as yet. Okay, thanks for that, Richard. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Um, Guy, please. Can we bring Gary Middleton into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Peter. Hopefully, uh, I'm now in the spotlight. Look, thanks, uh, Richard, for uh, your presentation today. Obviously, we're all aware of the challenges within our high street, and none more so than this week when you see some of the major retailers uh, been affected and a significant number of jobs potentially at risk. So th th that does concern us. So we're well aware of that. I think in terms of the high, high street voucher scheme, look, we've seen a lot of comments uh, from various uh, interested uh, individuals and groupings. So Belfast Chamber have come out. They've been hugely supportive of the scheme. I know my own local chamber in London Dairy has been supportive. Uh, it's been widely recognised as a, as a stimulus package, something about getting uh, you know, people uh, into into our high streets and into our town and city centres to try and stimulate uh, growth once again. So I think that's been very clear. Uh, I don't know why people would be confused about that. And I think that the other issue is around we need to ensure that we keep this initiative simple. When we start to overcomplicate uh, matters, I think that, well, it confuses two things. First of all, it has an impact on delivery, but it also has an impact in terms of the public understanding. So it's important that we don't overcomplicate a, a, an initiative that has been widely welcomed uh, by all within the sector. So we need we need to take that on board. In terms of the timing of, of this scheme, the, absolutely, it's it's vitally important that we get the timing right. The, the timing, the, the, well, in terms of the, the the finance and the money, the money has to be spent. This COVID money has to be spent by uh, or before the end of March. So uh, we're looking at February March time in terms of this initiative. We also need to ensure that that coincides and works alongside the fantastic news today of that vaccine uh, coming forward. And, and whilst we, we will ob obviously be cautious in terms of putting too much weight into that, we should be positive and optimistic that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But we also have to work alongside um, the, the, the restrictions and that exit strategy as we come out of those restrictions and continue to open our economy up. So all of these things have to play a part. But 
again, my, my, my I suppose, aim in, in all of this is to ensure that we do keep it simple. Let's not overcomplicate uh, an initiative that has been that has been widely welcomed, and that it is something that we can try and get. Um, as I say, spend on our high streets. And uh, we have to be mindful as well, because I know Mr. Dixon touched on uh, the issue of, well, why not just give grants to businesses? But grants do not have the multiplier effect that this voucher scheme will have. And I think you know, that's something that we cannot miss. Uh, you know, doing the same old, same old will not get us out of this crisis. We have to be innovative. Uh, we have to be forward thinking. And we have to do things uh, in a better way going forward. So that, that's re- all I really want to say. And I appreciate, Richard, that's probably more of a statement on my part than, than a question for yourself. But I do welcome uh, your very uh, valuable expertise in this matter. And no doubt the Department for the Economy and many officials will be listening intently in terms of what you had to say. So I really do appreciate you coming today. Not at all. Uh, one, th- one thing I would just add as well is, remember, it's, it's also going to be for the re- the retailers and the high street and how it markets, advertises and delivers on this scheme as well and how joined up that is, you know, and how do they, uh, you know, to maximise the effectiveness of it, not compromising the the obvious uh, health sort of restrictions, but how do they maximise to get get on board to get the message out? So, because ultimately, if you are going down this route of having retail vouchers and you're wanting to stimulate football and you're wanting to leverage more spend where people are out, they're spending more, they're uh, availing of the hospitality uh, sector, uh, eating out, etc., and encouraging them uh, to want to do that and, and to spend more money. Yeah, Richard, that's a very valuable point because it is important in all of these schemes that that work, uh, I suppose, it, it, it's done jointly with those those high street retailers, ensuring that the messages are joined up, that they're uh, consistent, and that the the uh, scheme is, does effectively what we're setting out for it to do, uh, which is to ensure that we can get uh, our high street retailers operating in a much better fashion than they are at this minute in time. So, thanks, Richard, for that. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, I mean, so just a, a, a point there, on what because I was I was thinking of it myself as well. The money has to be spent by the end of the year, but does that mean that? And you, this may be a question more so for the officials than for yourself. The the vouchers would have to be put in place before the end of the year, but the scheme may not necessarily have to be rolled out before the end of March. It could be timed after that. Would that be your understanding? Sorry, you asking me, Ter? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I suppose in theory, if the if it was cards or whatever, and the cards are loaded up, uh, and that uh, spend has been yeah. committed. Uh, but you know, that's that's one that the DFE officials following me will be able to answer. Hopefully, be able to answer. Thanks, um, Sinead. Can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Richard, for your presentation. Um, what I would, I, what I would say is that um, rather than just keeping the voucher scheme simple, I think it has to be really properly designed, uh, and we do know that it is the principal part of it is that it has to be a financial stimulus but it has to be a financial stimulus for those businesses most in need and i think it has to be um you know designed in the way that that local independent retailers can benefit from it um we, you know multinationals tend to be online um, uh, online businesses uh, and, and not everybody in the high street are, are suffering from COVID in the same way. So therefore, I think the stimulus packet, package has to be designed uh, properly and that's not simple and it's not simple to do. And I think to run out uh, with a voucher scheme that's not properly thought out about who needs to benefit from it would be would be a big mistake and I think it would be something that would come back and bite uh, the Department for Economy. So I would say, you know, take your time, make sure you design a package that does what you want it to do and that is uh, stimulate uh, the, the local economy. Um, I would also, uh, you know, I, I, 
I would wonder what risks there might be um, in, in, in the design concept of a, of a voucher scheme uh, such as this as well, because there, there, there could be risks uh, in relation to, to whatever way it's designed. And I think we need to just take a breath here and, and discuss all of the, the loopholes that may appear in, uh, in such a scheme um, that is not truly benefiting those that it's intended to be or that it may be exploited and you know i'd like to think of you know is there transferable you know is there a transfer system in, in these vouchers where where those people who do not need it um ca can can pass their vouchers over to those people who who, who need uh, and support it? because i don't think it just has to be a financial stimulus for the high street which of course, uh, as, as a benefit, but it can help support those that are in lower incomes or those that have been really adversely financially affected by COVID. It should be able to do both. And that means that it has to be designed really, really carefully. So uh, I wouldn't say uh, keep it simple. I think really look into how this um, is going to benefit uh, our local communities. Uh, and, you know, big internet, big multinationals do not need to benefit from this uh, from this type of stimulus. They are already benefiting uh, from the very nature of the structures of their bodies and organizations and the fact that a lot of them are online. And I think that this has to be about our small indigenous local independence in all of our high streets. That's who needs to benefit from, from this package. So it needs to be carefully thought out and carefully designed. Sorry, uh, Richard, in there was the question, is there a risk in the design concept of, of, of um, for businesses or for, for the Department for Economy, in fact? Is there a risk in there? Because we have seen poorly designed pr uh, programs coming forward and they have benefited nobody. Well, I think that just comes back to who it is you want to, to target. And if, if it is those... Uh, businesses on the high street which have suffered the most, which are currently experiencing lockdown restrictions, uh, that's where you would want to target it. Uh, because uh, if you don't do that and you do it for everybody, that's just diluting the stimulus and uh, it, it's not having the desired effect. So that in the same way as we had with the furlough scheme, where the furlough scheme was referring to when people were employed or on the payroll, you know, to me, it would seem that it's those businesses which have the lockdown restrictions applied to it, whether it's even like currently or whatever, those are the ones which are going to be uh, designed, you know, because there is, there is a danger that, yes, there's an imperative to uh, have money spent and use those resources, but you still want to do that as efficiently and as effectively as possible and uh, to target exactly uh, what do you want, you know, because it's like having a vaccine, we don't want to run vaccine out as quickly as possible and you don't apply it right and it doesn't get the desired effect similarly uh, with these kind of policies as well. Because ultimately I think voucher schemes are going to be with us throughout 2021 in some shape or form when you think of the culture, arts, sector, theatres, all those kind of things, there's going to have to be stimulus packages of how you do that and it's very difficult giving them rates relief or reducing their cost base doesn't do it they need demand and that needs to be stimulated to get the income so i think vouchers is going to be with us uh not just mm -hmm. for this but maybe beyond that in different ways in the same way as eat out the help out wasn't a one-off it's you know you're going to see vouchers appear in, in in other areas 95 million pound is an awful lot of money and it could do an awful lot of good um, but it needs to be very much targeted properly uh, and let's not make a, a mistake of just running it out because we've got a March deadline. Um, as I say, we've got a, there's a track record within the Department for Economy for, for delivering per projects because of a rush. Um, we want this to have a maximum impact and do uh, you know, stimulate our local economies and our local uh, businesses out there who are in desperate need and we've seen it. Um, we've seen it over the last uh, week, how desperate our high streets are. 
but we need to be very careful in how we run this out. And there's people, you know, uh, I know a lot of people that are saying, well, I don't need vouchers. I will be giving mine away or I will, you know, um, donate mine to, to other bodies that can use them more effectively. And, and there has to be a mechanism in doing that as well, because uh, not everybody needs, needs the vouchers because they will, as you talk about the pent up spend, uh, and we've seen that, um, that, you know, people will go out and, and spend money whenever um, the, the shops and the retail does open. But there are other people that can't go out and spend because their money has been withdrawn from them through unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if that benefits them as well, then, then you know, it's a win-win. Thanks, Sinead. Um, we move on to Claire, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose that other than I'm quite interested in, you know, how this will practically work on the ground. You know, are, are you aware of any examples where um, you can contain the use of, you know, a, a debit card or a, or a Mastercard within a particular postcode or within a particular type of shop? Um, because I suppose that's what. Um, the, the department is saying that it won't be able to be used everywhere and it'll only be able to be used in particular areas. But it, how, how does that work practically? Are there examples of that? And I suppose the other comment I would make as well is in relation to it being a voucher rather than a, a help out uh, to, uh, to or eat out to help out game, because that, that's a contained, um, a voucher would be a contained type of scheme. So it's a very specific amount of money given to a very specific number of people. Whereas my understanding of the, the eat out to help out scheme is that it was it, it was up to the, the various restaurants and cafes to submit um, the, the fifth percent on what they were uh, uh where they, they were claiming back the, the, the money that they were saving, if you like, by, by offering it at 50% or whatever else. Um, and, and does that mean then schemes like this are more likely if they are contained because obviously budgets are not infinite? So um, I, I suppose it's just around the mechanism which they've chosen to use to try and understand it from a department perspective and a budgetary perspective um, and also how it could practically work on the ground. Uh, very good questions. I'm afraid I'm probably just not not the person to deliver the answers. But yes, that those are the issues of how easy is it to contain that spend. I know, like some of the examples I was talking about in Australia, whereas my understanding was they were kind of like physical physical vouchers that you would have and hand over, as opposed to a card which you could go up and then get that sort of credited. But clearly, you know, in terms of speaking with the uh, the high street retailers who use these kind of cards, how they can be, you know, how this can be done. I suppose that's what you have to have to be looking at, same with maybe whether it's the kind of electricity companies and who have all their top up cards and things like that, or the, the mobile mm -hmm. phone industry. It's kind of think, thinking of, of, of things like that. And yes, how, how do you contain it? Because it is this, if you don't contain it, then effectively it's then the value of the stimulus has been spread and just diluted over and above and it's not as impactful as if it is contained where it's uh, required. Yeah, and I suppose even just thinking out loud, that loud there are other schemes um, it's almost like, you know, as a gift for you vouchers, I can't re uh, recall where you can spend um, one voucher in a number of different types of shops. Um, you know, so when you're, you know, maybe when people are purchasing those at, at, for, for gifts or, or, or uh, um, birthdays or whatever, you, you don't have to be just, I suppose, contained to one store or department, you know. So I, I wonder if the department's looking at it in that perspective. And again, that, that will be a huge job for the department because it's almost... The department giving their um, opinion about where you should be spending money, and you know, I, I think that's getting into a, a bit of a big brother kind of area, I, you know, which I'm not overly, you know, contained about. I think, you know, as adults, we all make our own choices about what we spend, so I, I think it will be difficult. But yeah, just, just thinking out loud. Thank you. <laughs> um, Richard, thank you very much for that um, briefing. It was it was really useful and gave us some. Hang on, no, no, Chair, Chair, we still have two members, John and Christopher. Hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry. Apologies. John, go ahead. Okay, no, no problem, Chair. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking in terms of, I'm no big fan of multinationals either, uh, but the idea that people won't be able to spend their money in them, if we look at yesterday, several hundred jobs gone from Debenhams and Arcadia, which are all part of a multinational 
uh, corporation, but the people who work in them are local people uh, and their jobs are gone. So I'm not sure exactly what the high street is anymore in 2020. Could you take no. a point? Just Very a quick that. point. A hundred quid goes further on Tesco than it will in the high street, especially if you're someone that's just been made unemployed. But yeah, and the... It also has to be said that you're more likely, and I have to emphasise, I'm not a big fan of multinationals, but you're more likely to be a member of a trade union and you're more likely to be paid above the minimum wage. So all those things have to be taken into account in terms of how we stimulate our economy. Uh, so what, I'm not sure in terms of what local exactly means, but the point I want to make is this. I want to see a scheme that sustains and creates well-paid jobs. Uh, and if it's only restricted to the high street, I'm not sure that will do it. So is there a way in terms of a scheme which allows people to spend, spend this in the economy? Uh, for instance, I, I look at, um, there was a question earlier on around the construction industry. Now, £200 or £100 not to go too far in the construction industry. Mm. But when you look at small construction firms, small maintenance firms, and you look at the amount of DIY that's going on in people's homes, and has gone on in people's homes over the summer. Um, if they were to benefit from the voucher scheme, I can see jobs being sustained and created through that. And my last question, Richard, is, is £95 million, pound, is it significant enough to create changes in prices? Could it have the impact of driving up prices rather than reducing prices, or is it simply not significant enough to do that? I don't, I don't think it would drive prices up and then that also comes back to the how do you engage the re retailers whenever you're going to, uh, if you're going to announce this scheme and roll it out, what is their buy-in, how are they going to market it, And uh, but I can't see how it would be seen to be uh, in inflationary, but it's whether do, they, do you use it and coincide with do they have sales or things like that because uh, to try and stimulate activity because it's as much as what they do and what are they going to do to, to market it uh, is kind of important. Uh, I think the, the point you made on the, the kind of construction workers and trades and things like that, it's, that's an area which uh, my understanding is that you know, the, the pent-up demand from the lockdown has been huge. I know personally trying to get it Get, get a joiner back in September and he was then talking about well it's going to be next year right from right from the, the start just because of the, the pent up demand coming in so if you try and design vouchers or things for them again that comes to the point of pent up demand are you throwing money at things when it's not actually needed or required and it would be better to wait until there is a time or there's other schemes that you can do uh, to try and stimulate the, the kind of DIY, because DIY, everybody who's had discretionary spend, who hasn't been able to go away on holiday or do things, has been turning to their homes, fixing them up and doing all that. So there is a kind of wall of money coming their way at the minute. Uh, but what when that turns and that changes, then that's when you have to look at those other things. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Christopher? Thank you very much. I think... I think the, the point around keeping it simple is important. This is not this idea does not form part of the government's anti-poverty strategy. This is an economic stimulus, and the two things are are different. And because the intention here is to directly inject money into the economy, um, I think it's important, therefore, that we don't go down the road of means testing or saying such and such a person should get it and such and such a person shouldn't. The purpose of this is to effectively empower the population to be in a position to spend some money. Um, my understanding as well is that the retail groups have made it clear that they don't want anyone to be excluded from the scheme and I absolutely take John's point regarding the impact that the, the, the Tesco's and the Sainsbury's and the what have you have had by the same token for a lot of people you know a week's, a week's shopping bought at Sainsbury's or Tesco's costs a lot lot less 
than a week's shopping bought by going to the local butcher, the local fruit shop, the local. Do you know? So I don't think we should tell people where they can or or cannot spend this money. Um, once once it's once it's out the door, it's out the door and it belongs to them and they can do what they wish um, with it, provided it's making our goal of money going into the economy happen. So I think I think that's important. And then the just two more points. Firstly, I, I don't agree um, with the Deputy Chair that we should take our time on this. This money needs to be spent by the end of March. And therefore, I, I want to be hearing from the Department ASAP how they intend to deliver um, this scheme. Because, as I said, there had previously been criticism of government departments not getting money out the door and not getting uh, money spent. So I think it's important that we get it out uh, as quickly as possible and get that money circulating in the economy. And then I just want to raise the final point, uh, Chair, with your indulgence. I think trans transferable vouchers is a bad idea for the same reason that I raised last week, that I, th I believe that these vouchers should be issued to individuals and not to households. Because we know mm. that during lockdown, instances of domestic violence, coercive control, um, and all of those issues have been exacerbated by lockdown. So if we had a situation or a mechanism whereby vouchers are transferable, I would worry that vulnerable people would be put uh, under pressure to be transferring um, their vouchers to those who are tormenting them. And, uh, and causing harm to them in their own homes. So, yeah. Go I mean, remember, just to get very brief, and we also agree that in addition to coercive control and domestic circumstances, yes. that transferability also has serious issues with regards to loan sharking, absolutely. drug dealing, and all, and all of those other behaviours yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, those are just some observations that I have, Chair. Chair, can you still hear us? Yeah, I can still hear yes, you. Yes, I'm, I'm done. Coming in. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay. Uh, is you still there? Chair, if you want yeah, to go sorry. ahead, yeah. I, 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 suppose, I suppose just coming back, it, it, it comes back to them. What is your policy designed to do? And if it's, it's then, you know, if it's for everybody and all sort of retailers, it's not a high street voucher scheme. You know, it's kind of changed. It's, it's something. It's something different. The other thing is, how is that viewed as being consistent with other policies that you've had on rates relief, where you view one cohort as being. Uh, able to avail of a relief and others not. So there, there's, you know, maybe sort of consistency issues there. And I think the key point about the the key rationale for targeting those most in need at the minute in terms of businesses is that they are the ones that haven't been allowed to be open, whereas lots of businesses, independent traders, have been losing business to some of the other multiple retailers simply because of government regulations are saying you cannot open your shop now so they're diverted elsewhere so in many ways a lot of this would be a means to kind of rebalance that to actually give them an opportunity for people to be uh, uh, putting money their way okay. okay yeah thanks for that that's great. Look, thank you very much, Richard, for, for your briefing. Um, and I would think it was really useful and members got a lot out of it. So thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Um, if we then move on to our, our next briefing is from Paul on the, um, the support schemes and the re recently made announcements in relation to um, additional support. I think Paul is on the, the meeting already. Yes, Chair, if we just, he's come into the spotlight now. Hi, uh, good morning, Chair. 
Yeah. Hiya, Paul, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and sure, if I just hand over to yourself for maybe an initial briefing and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of the time that um, is against us. Um, so uh, very, very brief. Um, so uh, allocate, So the department has been allocated a significant amount of money to support the economy. So October monitoring, we were um, allocated 60 million, and then most recently um, a sum of 137.7 million, so close to 200 million in total, um, has been allocated to us to support businesses and support the economy. That's um, uh, materialised in a total of eight schemes that are now either in play or under development. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly run through them, and then given the conversation or the, the evidence from Richard and then the, the detail would be useful particularly for me and probably for you to focus on the high street scheme so we've got the COVID restrictions business support scheme parts A and B that's live um, and then schemes which are in development and hoping to be launched incredibly soon are the a scheme for the newly self-employed a scheme for limited company directors uh, uh, pubs or licensed premises and um, B&Bs uh, another round of the digital selling uh, capacity grants um, uh, the minister recommended manufacturing rate relief, albeit that's obviously for the um, Department of Finance, not, not delivered by, by us. And then finally, the eighth one is um, the High Street Stimulus Scheme. So I, I was going to spend just a couple of minutes on that, mainly just really to um, explain where we are, uh, pick up a couple of the questions and then uh, open up to see um, uh, uh, questions from, from yourself in the chair. So. Um, Hopefully not to repeat too much of what we said, which was incredibly useful, by the way, uh, um, uh, in both Richard's evidence and also the conversation and debate um, uh, after that. So I think from our perspective, this is a really innovative intervention. I think while uh, Jersey has definitely um, sort of led the way doing something like this on the scale of um, you know, the, the number of consumers that we have in Northern Ireland is, 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 is genuinely new and, uh, and Innovative. When the ministers met with the business reps, we've got really positive responses uh, on this. So we are looking to inject some 95 million into the local economy. You know, in simple terms, this is about giving the high street a shot in the arm, building confidence and kickstarting the economic recovery when the time's right. Focus is on bricks and mortar. Um, so that's those that have been heavily impacted by the restrictions. So excluding uh, online retailers. We are we are moving incredibly quickly. Um, in order to deliver this, um, a certain set of decisions have to be made now, but then uh, um, we do have more time to consider um, other areas, particularly in relation to targeting. So key decisions that we need to make now are uh, uh, securing a, a provider in order to deliver the scheme. Uh, the reason why that's imperative is because of the leading times to procure cards. So that's the, the most important issue that we're, we're facing at the minute. Um, other decisions that are ahead of us, but you know, uh, need to be carefully con considered um, about the so like the so the purpose. So the, the reason why we're doing this is to stimulate activity. I think there was a discussion whether about give grants to businesses uh, or whether you use like a, the prepaid card to stimulate activity. The benefit of the card is that it delivers the multiplier effect. I think as Milton mentioned that you, you wouldn't get that same uh, effect from uh, a, a grant. Uh, decisions on targeting, again, not to be made uh, today or, or even this week. Um, there's a careful balance that needs to be made between uh, the delivery time scales, uh, so the imperative to deliver, not just simply because of financial pressures in order to, to um, because of the quirks of government accounting, but also there's a gen the, our expectation is there will be a genuine need in the um, uh, sort of new year, early spring for the high street to um, receive the support. So it's, there's, there's, um, the delivery timescale pressures come from the need to get something out uh, into the economy as quickly as possible. Um, and, and, and also I think we have to be careful about drawing hard lines between um, sort of like the purpose of the scheme. Um, you know, absolutely the focus needs to be on stimulating demand in the high street. Uh, I noticed from some of the conversations about whether it's uh, highly targeted and therefore delivers, you know, a, a, quite a purist um, scheme from an economist perspective. Um, there's a policy decision at the heart of that, and ministers will need to be comfortable that if if if, if you went that highly targeted um, route, um, we need to be comfortable that people that perhaps um, you know uh, spending using this using the card to uh, help buy their groceries wouldn't be able to do that. And I, I think that's. You know, that's a difficult question that we'll need to put to ministers. Um, 
you know, uh, I think earlier conversations were um, mentioned that the um, retail stakeholders, so the uh, Northern Retail Consortium and uh, Retail and I uh, have, got, have advised against um, targeting in that way for, 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 for those reasons. I think um, finance was mentioned as a particular issue, so we're aware of that as a, as a concern and we're in, um, engaging with colleagues in the Department of Finance. Um, there's questions about um, the deliverability of the scheme and how you um, how you might restrict. So, uh, and this is the benefit of using cards as opposed to vouchers is that uh, individual retailers have what's called a general merchant ID, and that gives the provider the ability to turn off or turn on certain IDs depending on how they're categorised uh, on their on their system. Um, and then I, I think uh, John O'Dowd mentioned about whether tradespeople could use. So that, again, coming back to the, the focus is really on bricks and mortar uh, rather than tradespersons in the in the economy. I think if you if you wanted to stimulate that type of demand, you'd probably look for um, sort of a specific scheme in that area. So I don't know, an example would be how you would sort of link up um, stimulating that type of demand with other policy objectives, uh, for example, in, in energy efficiency, for example. So that, that's a, a a very sort of a quick run through, mainly because I'm conscious of times. I think the key points are there's key decisions we need to make now are um, uh, appointing a supplier in order so we can meet the, the lead in times. Other decisions uh, to be made, uh, although the ministers engaged with the business community to get a feel for um, where we need to go on that. Uh, and happy to take questions and answer them to the extent we can in terms of where we are in the policy cycle. Uh, and also interested to take on board your uh, considerations and concerns so we can build them in as we're developing the scheme. Um, Paul, thanks very much for that. Um, it's, it's good to kind of get a, an outline of where, where you are and, and what the decisions are that need to be made around the, the voucher scheme. Um, if I can maybe just touch firstly on the some of the other schemes, um, just to get a, a bit of a... a um, an idea of where we are in terms of the development. I think the minister said yesterday in the chamber that the newly self-employed was um, going back to the executive under, I, I think she said, urgent procedure. So is that one likely to be coming on, on board um, quickly? And is the company director one um, in development alongside that? Um, yeah. So. Um our expectations are hopefully subject to executive approval that we can get the newly self-employed up and running as quickly as possible because you know we're conscious that this population has been excluded from the HMRC self-employed income support scheme. Um, so subject to executive approval, we'd, we'd like to get that, um, as I say, up and running as quick as possible. Um, on that, and it's because of that that reason that we decoupled the two schemes from the newly self-employed from limited company directors. We didn't want to make the decisions. Uh, and policy um, analysis that's still required in the company director's scheme delay the self-employed. Um, I think there's, because of the nature of the population, we need to understand a bit more about who's eligible, uh, who's in scope, and, and given the funding envelope, uh, how we could, um, which is 20 million, um, how we could divide that funding envelope reasonably across the population uh, and, uh, um, quickly. Um, so that's but that's, uh, it, it's not to say that that's on the long finger. We're, we're working quickly, uh, uh, engaging with stakeholders. I, I know in particular, the Institute of Directors have been really helpful in, uh, in helping us understand a bit more about the, the population and who, um, you know, where the, where the need for support lies. No, that's, that's useful to know. Um, and in relation to the newly self-employed, is it, is it likely that it will be the side of Christmas um, that those people could expect to get support? I think that would be um, really welcome if that was the case. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Look, thank you for that. And then just in relation to the voucher scheme, yeah, there was an interesting conversation there that took place with Richard. Um, and I, I think, you know, even listening to, to that conversation, it, it does kind of um, lay out the, the, I suppose, some of the challenges in terms of trying to, uh, and what we're trying to achieve with it. Um, and uh, as, you know, I, I certainly um, the thing feel that it does have to be an economic stimulus, but obviously there are people who are, are financially struggling and, and so we shouldn't limit it uh, particularly in terms of what it can deliver for those as well. Um, so I, I just, I, I think that it is important that we, we maybe just think through some of that and I, I'm glad that, that that is, you know, the decisions and those are, aren't 
ones that have to be taken just today. Um, in relation to that question that, that I, I put to Richard that wasn't really, I suppose, for Richard, but in relation to when the money needs spent, does the if the vouchers are in place by the end of the year, is that sufficient in terms of, of the, the funding envelope having been utilised and the actual spending of the vouchers could then take place post the end of the financial year? Yeah, that's the, the detail that we need to check with colleagues in finance about whether, um, you know, in effect, is, is us transferring the money to the supplier for them to load onto the cards in this financial year, is that sufficient? Um, and, and to be really honest, I, I don't know enough about the, um, the quirks of government accounting to give you a definitive answer on that, but it's a, it's a known issue um, that we've got that we're working to provide an answer to as quickly as possible. Okay, well, look, thanks for that from me, Paul. I'm going to hand over to John Dowd, first of all. Paul, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Paul. Um, th as the Chair said, the, the previous conversation was very interesting, and it's not often uh, a funding announcement is made on the basis of a laudable idea. You know, all the details aren't in place, and there's £95 million pounds to spend. But the, the idea behind the scheme, I think, is excellent, and, and putting that amount of money into the economy and stimulating uh, the economy is a good thing. And I think also you hinted at that as well. It also raises morale uh, among consumers uh, and, and people who will be getting a few pounds, and that in turn where people have the extra money to be able to spend as well. But can you, just in terms of how much is set aside for the administration of the scheme, you had mentioned that you are, you're currently looking for a, a partner to uh, whatever term, whatever we come up with, or whatever you come up with in terms of it's a cured, or maybe, what sort of money is set aside for administration? Um. So, it's, so we're using a, a Crown Commercial Services Framework in order to procure um, the services. Um, so that's, um, we will go out for a tender and um, we won't know that obviously the, the, the costs that um, the individual bidders have submitted until that process is completed. We, we have spoken to Jersey because obviously Jersey's delivered it, albeit on a much smaller scheme. And I think their estimate was it was about 4% of the cost of the scheme. So uh, about 4%. Okay. We, um, uh, we, what we don't know at this stage is because um, I think there's only 120,000 in Jersey, given our scale, um, what impact that scale will have on reducing that number. Uh, and we won't know that until the bids come in. Okay. Um, and is that, are, are you going out, to, so is the, the bids out to, to, to the banking sector in the sense of who, who can manage this? Uh, so it's a, so it's a framework, uh, so that the, the benefit of using the Crown Commercial Services framework is that there is a, um, a, a defined um, list of companies that are already on the framework and it enables us to call off that framework quickly in order to meet the, um, uh, the delivery time scale. So rather than it being a, an open tender in the traditional sense, it's, it's more defined, enables us to move a lot quicker, but still within um, obviously the, the, the strict government procurement guidelines and, and rules that we have to operate in. Okay, um, and can you clarify, does the money have to be spent by March, or if the money is committed by March, is that satisfy uh, the budget requirements? Again, uh, it's, it's, it's a known issue that we've got that we're looking to, to clarify, and as, as soon as we've got an answer, we'd, we'd be happy to write to you just to confirm, confirm that point. Okay, thank you. That's me, Chair. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Hi, thank you very much, Paul, and um, congratulations on moving departments or moving your job now into recovery uh, for COVID. Um, I, I suppose I, I'm glad that you listened into the previous conversation um, earlier because it was interesting, and I'm still not entirely clear um, just what the, the, the purpose of the scheme is, because on one hand, we're saying it's to stimulate the high street. That's the main principle, um, uh, and uh, that's very welcome. But on the other hand, uh, you know, we have some members saying, well, you know, we need, to, we, we need to be able to spend it everywhere, like the multinationals. We have to remember that the multinationals have been, you know, and I'm talking supermarkets, have been working throughout this entire COVID pandemic and have been doing very, very well. So therefore, if we're going to stimulate the high street, then we need to stimulate 
those businesses that weren't doing well, that had to close down and didn't, uh, you know, that have been really heavily impacted, small family owned businesses. So therefore, we need to target them. It's just not, we can't just create a scheme that one size fits all because it doesn't. And it's not going to stimulate and it's not going to save the high street if everybody that gets a voucher goes to Tesco's or goes to Asda or goes to Sainsbury's. That's not going to save the high street. And whilst I, I understand what John said about, you know, uh, the recent job losses in Arcadia and um, and, and Debenhams, let's be honest, they, these job losses didn't come about because of COVID. These are long-standing issues on those companies um, and, and, and their business model. So they're, these are not uh, covid uh, job losses. These are, uh, you know, a, a transition and a different retail model. So if we want to save our independence, we want to save the actual, you know, um, essence of what we have in the high street, then we really need to target those vouchers to be spent in areas um, that are is going to give the greatest uh, movement. And, and that's what I really want, you know, uh, it was indicated earlier on that you're seeking to have a conversation around all of this today. And I think that that's what I really want uh, you to hear from, from, from my perspective. This, this money needs to stimulate the businesses that have been had the greatest impact. And with the greatest respect, that is not Tesco and other multinationals of that type. They have they have actually done very well out of COVID, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, and I know that it's local people that are, are are working in them, and they will continue to work in them because they're not at risk. Those shops are not at risk, um, but our local high streets. And when I, and and I suppose high street is a very generic term as well. And I, and I want to get in. I'm talking just about local sh local shops wherever they are. Should they be in a village in Clody or should they be in uh, in in Derry City Centre? I'm talking about shops that have had a really adverse impact as a result of COVID. Uh, yeah, th thanks. I, so I, I think we're on the same page. I think in the, in the department. I think in terms of what the what the what's the policy intent of this? Absolutely. So we're seeing real pain in the in the high street, um, and we recognise that this is an opportunity to kickstart the recovery and really support those businesses. So the question then becomes, how do we target that support? Um, so we, we, you know, we've heard from uh, Aidan Connolly and Simon Hamilton in the in the chamber is that exclusions would be harmful. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't target in different ways. And I think what, what will be absolutely significant and uh, a game changer around this, and, and this is a lesson from Jersey, uh, is that what's the communications package and communications campaign that surrounds this? So the Jersey card had spend local on it. There was a, a, a huge effort um, in order to encourage the types of spend that exactly you're talking about. You know, it's, it's the businesses that have been suffering that need the support. I think what was also interesting from the Jersey example is that how businesses themselves responded to it. So, uh, you know, independent retailers were offering additional discounts if you use the voucher or that use the card in their stores. And then that then further sort of, I guess, incentivizes and tunnels people uh, uh, into using the, the card in the area that we want to get to. And I think just, just coming back to the policy decision that you know if we, we have to be clear if we go down the um the hard line view and we draw a clear line between what the card can and cannot be used for there's consequences of that and those consequences obviously will uh, impact upon the you know the big retailers that yeah absolutely have done well but it will also impact on the people that perhaps would have used that card um to buy their groceries uh, and and on balance if there's a small number of people that you know do use the card in uh, any number of the retailers but the vast majority go on to spend it in the high street, then I think overall the policy would have been a success. And, and then just one quick other question, wet pubs, 10.6 million additionality uh, money for, for wet pubs. Can you give me any more insight into what that actually is for? Um, so it's the, uh, the, the, the... I guess the main point behind it is that this is a group of people, a group of businesses in our economy that have had a, a really difficult time uh, since March, uh, and it's recognition um, of, of the, you know, you know that hardship and you know an ongoing hardship. So where uh, the minister asked us to look into options to um, develop a scheme to support those businesses. Um, now, 
there's quite a broad population that, um, that we're looking at um, and uh, we need to provide the minister with uh, options of um, you know, how broad do we want to go and therefore the implications of that and the individual spend uh, within that funding envelope or whether it's more targeted. So we're in the process of providing advice to the minister who then present um, advice to the uh, executive on how that could be delivered quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Gary, please. <coughs> Go ahead, Gary, we can see you. <laughs> Apologies about that. Yes, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Paul, um, for your presentation, and, and congratulations on uh, your post that you're now in, and wish you well. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of this stuff has followed on the previous conversation uh, that we just had with uh, with Richard, but look, I, I just want to uh, put, point it out again that you know this week has been one of the darkest weeks for our high streets. I speak, I speak for, for Londonderry City Centre when we look at the potential of thousands of jobs at risk. So I do take issue when people you know, throw out terms like, oh, let's take our time, let's, you know, let's, let's exclude, exclude people. I think our focus at this minute in time is about getting this scheme. And I think the vast uh, majority of members understand that this is about stimulating the local economy. Uh, we, we need to listen to those business leaders, which the department clearly has been doing because the engagement and the letters which we have received from all of those stakeholders, they're, they're unanimous in what they say. They want this scheme uh, to be ruled out. They want it to, to stimulate the local economy. And, and uh, you know, if that means that certain, you, you've, you've said this, Paul, if it means a small number of people want to use a voucher to get their groceries, then I don't think we need to get into a situation where those people uh, should be excluded or penalised for doing so. As constituency MLAs, we deal, deal on a day and daily basis with people coming through uh, for food banks. Even now, the concern around uh, the fact that, that you know, jobs have been lost left, right and centre. This is about trying to get people to use uh, those vouchers and to, to, to secure jobs on the high street. So I think people really need to not miss the point on this initiative. And when we say keep it simple, it's about ensuring that we, we get the money out uh, as quickly, or the vouchers out as quickly as possible, and that we don't have the time to just you know, kick the can down the road and, and just be negative with this stuff. We need to be positive. And I really do welcome these initiatives, as, as other members have said. You, absolutely. You know what? We could do with more money. We could do with uh, the schemes being widened, widened out and extended uh, beyond what they are. But look, we're, we're dealing with what, with, with, what, um, with what we have in terms of the envelope available, uh, and we need to just get on with it. So I just want to just encourage you, Paul, to continue that engagement with the, the chambers right across Northern Ireland, uh, the retail consortium, retail and all of those stakeholders that you work with on a day and daily basis, uh, because those are the people with the expertise uh, and, and I think that we can get a scheme that will be efficient uh, going forward. So thanks for that. Yeah, th thanks so much, Gary. Yeah, and, and yeah, absolutely. That's sort of it's bang on message with where we are. Um, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Paul. Um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair. Paul, thanks for your efforts and wish you well in the post. A um, couple of other schemes, I think we've covered the, the vouchers fairly well. I understand you listened in to the, the previous feedback. The B&B scheme and the hotel sector are ones that are very much on my mind. The, num we have a number of large hotels that have been lying empty now for months. They're hoping to have a good Christmas. It's very uncertain. They've had little or no support outside of rates and furlough. The, the ones that are over what, 51k rateable value and are still waiting on, on the scheme to be developed. So what's the progress on that, Paul, in relation to the hotels and B&B scheme, the 4.1 million for B&Bs? Uh, yes, I, I, so the B&Bs first, so that's, um, so this is a population that because they're domestic rates, they've yep. been outside of the, the local restrictions uh, support scheme, the DOF scheme. So this uh, department's working with um, uh, tourism on the island to TNI because um, uh, uh, these B&Bs are registered uh, with TNI, so that gives us a, you know, unusually in these schemes, we actually have a data set to work from. So, um, 
Uh, and again, similar to the pubs, um, uh, TNI and, and the department needs, uh, and officials in the department are working to sort of uh, drop the scheme, uh, get that to the minister as quickly as possible, and then uh, do executive approval. Uh, moving to large hotels, um, again, the policy intent is that particularly, that, so this is the over 51 NAV rating, is that while the LRSS is providing welcome support, the fixed costs that these businesses are incurring are significant. And then that's the policy rationale for um, a, a, a top up payment, if you like. And again, in the same boat, you know, just with the volume, you know, eight schemes is, is, a, is a huge amount of work. We're just in the process of taking that to the minister and, and getting executive approval on the uh, on the amounts that fit within that particular funding envelope. But the, the urgency on all schemes isn't lost on us. Have you any idea when the hotel one will be live? Um, no, I'm afraid I can't. Um, uh, but I mean, it's, um, still a, as soon as possible, I think, is the um, is, is the best I can do. And I, and I appreciate, uh, you know, I, I speak a lot to the, the sector, and I appreciate that's not what they want to hear. But um, unfortunately, I can't give a, a fixed date. I'm afraid. Okay. The other point was mentioned earlier, just on the the card system. Uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, so how are we ensuring value for money in, in the management of it? The tender process, will it be a normal tender process or will it be a short-circuited process? And how do we manage the risks in, in ensuring value for money and, and quality and what is being delivered? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, while it's compressed, it's absolutely uh, in line with sort of government procurement guidelines. I think that's the real benefit of using Crown Commercial Services. So we'll rely heavily on you know, the established structures. So we'll, um, you know, it'll be compressed but above board. Uh, in terms of uh, value for money for the scheme, I think we're, I think John O'Dowd mentioned earlier that, that the timing of this is unusual, and it's, that's uh, to put it mildly, um, you know, it's. It, it's Ordinarily, we would have worked up a, a well-developed business case, um, understood all the value for money considerations, provided advice to the minister, and then progressed. Because of the timescales, we're going to have to sort of uh, uh, compartmentalise that a little bit and take just decisions as as and when we need to do it. We're partly fortunate in that um, most of the decisions that affect value for money don't need to be made this week or today. So, particularly on um, the, so for example, the targeting of the scheme. Um, we can take that in slightly slower, slower time, uh, and we can ensure that we don't. We do have the analysis to demonstrate the scheme has value for money. Uh, I think related to that, there's um, uh, the risk of fraud and error uh, is included within this scheme. So then, uh, again, this is the a benefit of a, a card is that we can um, uh, access data sets, databases that give names, addresses, and date of birth, and we can use that information to ensure that cards are going to the right people. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, I'm going to bring in Stuart, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Paul, for, for, for joining us today. Um, can I just first of all uh, ask you a couple of questions around the, the, the whole area of company directors and the newly self-employed? Um, obviously, time is of the essence because these are people who have now clearly waited the longest. Can you identify any other groups of people who have been excluded? And then the next question is, <clears throat> really two bits to this. One, um, there are people who find it very difficult to, uh, if, they be, if, they, if they've been denied an opportunity to get funding from any one of the schemes and, and, and if there are additional schemes being brought online, um, we need to give, you need to give serious consideration to a, a quick appeals process for people. Um, and and uh, in addition to that, um, it, it, many uh, businesses and people will come to elected representatives, whether it's MLAs or local councillors, um, or indeed even local councils. Um, it, it's, it's imperative that, um, that we have some form of quick um, phone contact system uh, to be able to raise queries. Um, that, that's, that's the area around um, the, the, the various schemes that are ongoing and those which are about to be delivered. Um, going on then to the whole issue of the, the potential for a card scheme, and you've heard the whole conversation so far today, I understand 
But, it, but this does take us back to the very fundamental. What, what is the purpose of the scheme? And will you be in a position to very clearly and very succinctly set up, once the scheme is launched or about to be launched, uh, will you be able to, to, to be very clear in, in setting out the purpose of the scheme? Um, I think most people, many people seem to feel um, that there's a conflict between it's, a, it's an economic stimulus or it is there to help people who've been uh, suffering as a result of the pandemic um, and you hear people wanting to do altruistic things with their cards like transfer them to charities or uh, give them to other good causes. Um, but if the purpose is none of those things and the purpose is just simply uh, to stimulate a sector of the economy, then uh, that needs to be stated very clearly and up front. And for example, will it be printed as a message on any, on any card? Um, we're not giving you this because we want you to, to personally benefit from it, although people will, but we're giving it to you uh, to stimulate the high street economy. Uh, and again, others have asked about the procurement of the card. Uh, I would have some concerns um, that we are giving f that, that money will inevitably end up in uh, the, the, the retail banking sector uh, to deliver this, but there are other there are other organizations that are capable of doing that delivery. Uh, people organizations like Royal Mail who've been treated as disgracefully um, by the public sector over the last number of years. Um, uh, and one other final quick question in relation to all of this. Uh, whatever way in which this is rolled out, uh, not only are you telling us that there's a cost to provide the card and an income for the card provider, but card providers also uh, take commission from card machines and shops. How will that be controlled? Because basically you're paying at both ends. Um. Okay, so I, do, I just run through them in turn. Uh, so in terms of uh, who's excluded, the, the gaps in the schemes, all, all of the schemes are targeted at people that have been impacted. Um, so anybody who uh, has been able to continue to operate uh, that may have felt some of the, the impacts of COVID, you know, as, as almost everybody has, but those impacts have not been significant. Um, the schemes aren't designed for those people. Um, it's my expectation and, and, and you know, this is where the value of the challenge function from the committee really comes into its own is if you if you're still seeing gaps in the economy where there is people that, um, that haven't been supported then please let us know that and then we can assess whether either you know of their mate schemes whether they can be adapted to include them or whether something bespoke is required um but you know across their mate schemes uh, in addition to everything else that's been delivered, and that, that is an, an unprecedented level of support that's been delivered into the economy. Uh, but like I said, you know, if the gaps, then please let us know. Um, again, then moved on to the, the high street scheme. So the, the, the purpose of the scheme is absolutely to support bricks and mortar retail in Northern Ireland high streets. So that's stimulating demand uh, in, in that area that's been heavily impacted. That will you know is, is absolutely linked to kickstarting our recovery. So moving out of this, you know, helping businesses just survive this period into adapting and adjusting into you know, the, what, what we hope will be an economic recovery. I think uh, just just to repeat Maria' um, response to uh, I think it was to uh, the deputy chair is I think the comms package that is wrapped around this will be absolutely essential and what you know while it's not a decision for today i think there are lessons from jersey uh, and then you know key lessons that we've picked up from engagement with stakeholders so far about how we can target spend through our communications uh, and also you know support that targeting uh, by encouraging businesses themselves to incentivize participation through um, you know extra offers or you know other own branding so that's that's absolutely um, our intent. And then, sorry, what, what was your final question? Sorry, Stuart, I've, I've just yeah, temporarily. So the, the final area was not only uh, have, you, yeah. have you indicated that we're going to have to pay to buy the cards, there'll be a service charge yeah. for that. But of course, uh, traditionally, unless you make it a, a condition, uh, there's also a charge to the retailer as well for the use of his card machine because they, they yeah. have to pay for that as well. And not yeah, all sorry, not yeah. all not all retailers. Many retailers will do things like exclude the first five pounds. So if something's less than five pounds, they prefer to have cash because that basically cool. just eats up the card trans the card machine transaction costs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
happy to look into it into more detail and come back to you if that's um, um, my understanding at least is that that transaction cost is included in the price of the goods that retailers sell it's almost assumed that, um, that, that that's covered but well I'll look into that and take advice and um, if you're content just to come back to you with a better answer on that Stuart if that's okay thank you we'll take a note of that yeah uh, I, I think <laughs> you for mentioned that. the post office Stuart as well so that they're included on the crown commercial framework that we're, we're using Okay, thank you. Um, I think John O'Dowd wants to come in for a final question. Uh, it's just a quick point, Sharon. Thank you for letting me back in again. Paul, you have referenced the fact that you're in discussions with uh, Chamber of Commerce retail representatives, and quite rightly so. Uh, but one of the, the, the added benefits of this scheme is that those families who have either, and workers who have been furloughed or lost their jobs and have lost income, will also be using this, these cards as a welcome relief. Uh, to their income. Are you in discussions with any consumer organisations, for instance the Consumer Council, or any anti-poverty organisations, yeah. as to how the card could assist both groups, the high street and the consumer? I haven't spoken to the Consumer Council yet, but they, ha they have reached out, uh, partly because they've got a lot, of a lot of experience in these types of schemes, so that they're on my list of people to speak to. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, thanks very much for the brief. Sorry, Chair. Go ahead. Gonna, if, if, if there are groups that you're aware of that you think could be helpful here, please send them through. That's where um, you know, we're, in, we're in listing mode and uh, as much as we are in rapid policy development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the briefing, Paul. It has been really useful, and it is good to know that that um, you, you are in listening mode as well. And, and I'm sure members, if they do have any ideas, they or any thoughts around it, they can send them through to yourself. And 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 thanks again for taking the time to come and talk to us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, members, we are a little bit pushed for time because you guys have to be out of that room by one o'clock. So um, we are going to do the two SRs in your pack and then agree if, if members are content to deal with the arrest of the items uh, in the pack by correspondence. Great. So if members can move into item number nine, which is the SR 2020-279, the Gas Internal Markets Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 259 of your pack, and the SR 2020-279 is at page 260 of your pack. Mm -hmm. This statutory rule will amend some existing energy legislation in order to transpose the requirements of the EU Gas Directive 2009-73 EC, the 2009 Gas Directive, as amended by the EU Directive 2019-619, the 2019 Gas Directive Amendment. Um, if members will recall that we agreed the SL1 uh, at committee on the 18th of November. So this rule is subject to negative resolution, and if members are content with the SR, I'll put the question. Members, Great. Content, yep. Great. members are content, Chair. That the Committee for the Economy has um, agreed SR 2020-279, uh, the Gas Internal Markets Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that, the, um, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. So, members Thank content, you. then right. we'll move on to uh, number 10, which is SR 2020-281, the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 309, and then at page 312 is the SR. We um, dealt with this one just last week, and it makes amendments to the principal regulations made necessary by the extension of the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme until the 31st of March 2021. The statute rule ensures that consistent with the principles regulations as originally made, various statutory entitlements based on a week's pay and connected with termination of employment are not reduced as a result of an employee being furloughed under the job retention scheme. So again, the rule is subject to negative resolution and if members are content, I will put the question. Are members um, content? That the committee for the members are content. Has a, 
Thanks, Peter. Um, the, the Committee for the Economy has agreed SR 2021, the Employment Rights Northern Ireland, Order 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. So um, we will then move to um, item, I don't know what item number it is. We, Chair, if we go um, to... Item 13. Yeah. Yeah, which yeah, is the yeah. date, time and place of our next meeting um, and it will be Wednesday the 9th of December in room 30. So um, thank you members very much. Right, Chair, just can I come in really quickly today. there, apologies. We're actually going to be in room 29. Um, next week's one of our short meetings. Okay. Great. So we'll be in 29, but we'll send out further memos. I'll also be sending out further information on, on the mm -hmm. debate Let's on Tuesday on. again um, for our macroeconomic inquiry on the outlook. So, Chair, thank you for that. Okay. You could end up in Thanks, Peter. Education or something. Thank you, Chair. Well, well that's how This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland.